here. All right. Well, we're about 30 seconds away, everyone. 30 seconds. Let's uh, start to get ready here, shall we? Sounds good to me. Yeah. All right. Just a reminder, Super Chat is open. I know last night a bunch of you went a little wonky, but, uh, you know, uh, that's okay if you want to do it again, you can. Hit that subscribe button if you don't mind. You can do a little shopping on our website, the SOR Vault. And here we go in five seconds, everyone. We're going to have a great night tonight. I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. of Central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free for you at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We often look to chase the paranormal, running into haunted grounds, hallowed cemeteries, looking for that thrill of adventure. However, for some out there, the paranormal isn't very fun at all. It's completely terrorizing. Let's meet our guest tonight, author Lynn Monet, whose book Omnipresent, which can be found on Amazon, Google, everywhere. It's a true tale of what it's like to endure the dark side of spirits, ghosts, and even demons. The book details the story of how her family endured these horrors of living in a haunted house. Her website, lynnmonet.com. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire, brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. Lynn Monet, welcome to Spaced Out Radio for the first time. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I'm very excited for you to be here as well because I love stories like yours. I do. And just in time for Halloween to have you booked this close, I, I'm pumped up. I have been pumped up for this one since last night's show ended, and I think this is going to be a beauty, Lynn. Well, I, I hope so. I hope that it also brings some enlightenment to people. Um, that's part of my intention, and that was my intention with writing my book. Lynn, let's learn a little bit about you. Before you started having these these encounters in your home, and we're going to get deep, 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 deep into this tonight. What did you know about the paranormal? Well, um, when I was a little girl, about five years old, I was able to, which is common with children between a newborn and age five, to be able to see interdimensionally. And of course, you know, the kids talk about their invisible friends and things like that sometimes. But in my family, growing up in the late Oh, where did he go? Did the ghosts get us already? Seriously. What happened there? At least the ghost could give us a little bit of a warning here. What's going on? I don't even know. Weird. I'm going to have to call her back. Like the phone line just went completely dead. Let's try it again. See if she picks up. Four. No. All right. Well, that's not going to work. That's not going to work at all. All right. This is why we get a second phone number here. You know? And we know, just from personal experience here, it's not aliens. Because she doesn't have aliens. She's got ghosts. Ghosts are already playing here. See if we got her here. I can just hear it. There's the ring. Isn't it weird? 
Good start to a paranormal show with the phone cutting out. What else is going to happen? Maybe she doesn't want to tell her story. I don't know. She's not answering her cell phone. I'll guarantee you she's got to ring her up. All right, so that went to voicemail. <clears throat> we'll try the other number again. It's, honestly, this is kind of exciting. Get Just about to get into some paranormal talk here. My goodness, I can't get a hold of her. I cannot get a hold of her. This is... <laughs> This is weird. Strange. We'll just wait a little bit here. So Lynn's story, if you want to find her book, it's called Omnipresent. And it's a story of her own family's experience. I don't want to give up too much here because I want her to tell it. I hope she, like, didn't lose power or something. And maybe there was a lightning storm or an accident or, you know, a, a 70s party hotline on her phone. Let's see if we can get her cell phone again. Hello? There you are. You got Yeah, it. what happened? I don't know. I've been trying to get a hold of your, uh, on your home phone, and it just keeps going to, like, some weird voicemail kind of thing. Uh, I'm not surprised that happens sometimes, but not with the phone. But I saw sometimes demons and things like that don't like being talked about. Do you want to call me back on the landline, or do you want let, me to see Well, let, let, let's go here until uh, until this goes. We got a good connection. We got a good connection. Okay, good. So let's go back. All righty. Let, let's reverse. We're gonna re- we're gonna reel in the fishing line here. All right. And if you actually saw me, I'm actually reeling in. You know, like I would. <laughs> And, and you, what you what did you know about the paranormal before all of this weird stuff started happening? Well, um, I I I kind I kind of had the ability when I was a child to see interdimensionally. Um, at around age five, of course, you know, I would talk about seeing things within the household, but um, my parents were would get upset with me a lot of times and they didn't want this information to get outside into the community that it was one of those families with with, with a child with with issues so it was squelched pretty much um in the home and then as i got a little bit older i got around age 10 traditional religion kind of went into play and um I was being told that what I was seeing, whether it was good or bad, was demonic, and I was being told that because of my ability to see spirit, um, that I was going to go to hell. And, of course, the going to hell thing and the demon thing scared the bejesus out of me as a 10-year-old, and I learned very quickly to not talk about it anymore. And I also tried very, very hard to ignore my ability um, and so that I would appear normal, and that kind of went... Uh, along okay until I purchased uh, this house in 2005 and where I was continuously exposed to demonic presences and also a spirit of a young man that had hung himself in the house and it just blew that interdimensional ability to see um, that way to see interdimensionally wide open that is absolutely strange you were a weird kid. Yeah. Not going to lie. You're a weird kid, you know, but I mean that well, with all due politeness. Yeah. You know, the thing is, is it's a very, very common um, psychological studies have even shown that it's very common that children between newborn and age five don't have certain filters in play, psychological filters in play. And um, this, this allows them to see interdimensionally. And a lot of times you'll hear a child talking about an invisible friend um, those, those same filters also on the flip side, when a person is getting closer to their time to pack, to cross over, those filters start to efface. And it's another reason why a person may um, be with a loved one that is actively passing or, or, or getting close to that time frame. And they start talking about seeing people, family, um, you know, members and relatives of the family that these people that are embodied also have been familiar with, but they know that they're dead. And all of a sudden this, this uh, loved one that's getting ready to pass is now seeing these things in the room and talking to them. 
you know, people, of course, flip out and they think that it's hallucinations. But, uh, you know, it's actually true that Uncle Bob is standing there in the room with them and they just need to say hello instead of thinking that the person is flipping out. But with that being said, um, you know, at around age five, it, things kind of shift a little bit. Some of those filters start to come into play. But prior to that, they are wide open. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Did you grow up in a religious family and that's why there was this fear of anything paranormal? Um, it wasn't so much that they were religious. We were Presbyterian. Um, it's just that, you know, back in that era, it was all about the, the common phrase was the Joneses. Everybody, you know, um, didn't want the Jones, Joneses to know, so to speak, or, or, or you didn't want to be different. I mean, if you had a kid that was seeing things, they needed to be in a nut house. So um, people just, it was, they didn't want to have that stigma um, on the family, if my family didn't want to have the stigma on the family because they had a child that would have the ability to to see interdimensionally. Unbelievable. So when you were going through this as a child, that had to be frustrating for you. It was because, you know, and, and this is one of the things that I have written in my book as well that is very unique. Um, in the back, there is a self-help section, and it talks about you know, children and how they're affected by these spiritual, you know, things in the house. A lot of times when a house is haunted, the children know it before the parents do. And the worst thing that a parent can say to a child is, um, there's nothing there. You're not seeing what you're seeing. There's nothing there. And the kid's sitting there looking and they're saying, yeah, but there is. There's somebody standing there next to you and he's got no head, you know, um, and, and also, parents coming back and saying to their child, for instance, oh, well, you know, it's your Aunt Lulu coming to watch over you or your, or your guardian angel. Well, if it was really their Aunt Lulu or their guardian angel, it wouldn't be scaring them to death by shaking their bed and pulling off their covers in the middle of the night. So it's really, really important for parents to determine when their child consistently talks about an invisible friend or consistently talks about seeing the same images over and over, not like pink elephants climbing on the wall, but like, for instance, a particular person or a particular couple of people that they may see. The, the main thing that the parent needs to ask is, are these, these visitors making you feel uncomfortable or asking you to do something that you know you're not supposed to? Because a lot of times demons will approach um, – people and posing is something other than what they are they can pose as a child they can pose as somebody familiar to them they can even mimic sound and 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 voices so um that is that's very important with the child and and not to tell the child that nothing is there just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not there and to give them some ways to empower themselves give them a little prayer give them um, a song to sing that 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 is a spiritual thing, um, like like a prayer that would kind of move the negative energy away, and to tell them that it's okay to tell the thing, I don't want you here, leave now, you know, call on Jesus Christ, call call on, you know, Archangel Michael if you're Catholic, whatever you need to call on, but to command the the thing to to leave and give them that empowerment. So that you know they have tools to work work with, and not telling them that there's nothing there, or trying to make it okay when it's not. That sounds very enlightening for a lot of people who have maybe have never gone through this before. And we have a lot of listeners who are in that situation. They're listening because they're curious. They're listening because they don't know what it what it's like to have hauntings around you. Now, previous to you moving into this house from hell. Did you ever have any paranormal experiences? Not, not anything to that degree. Um, I always was able to see um, out of my peripheral vision. Every once in a while, I would catch something. But of course, you know, I I just kind of let it go as a fleeting thought because, again, I thought that it was part of some of the leftovers from my childhood. And of course I've been repeatedly told there's nothing there, you know, it's your imagination. 
And then I went to school and I became a nurse and I'm, you know, working, <laughs> um, going through this, the, the psychiatric ward with people with schizophrenia and things like that. So, you know, I, I shut it down so that, so that I would seem more normal and I didn't really talk about it with anybody. Okay, so did your family ever admit to having any type of of entities or encounters previous to this home? No, but that home, but the home that I grew up in, definitely had some issues in that house. Definitely, I mean, the pans would rattle in the kitchen when when I'd be sitting in the living room with my mother visiting, and we'd be hearing the the cabinets open and close. So there were some issues in that house, but nobody talked about it and again when you did bring it up uh, like I said I would you know get in trouble um for it I would actually get yelled at for it really why 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 the anger why the haste towards you I mean we're supposed to as children be able to go over to our parents and say this is what's happening this is what I'm seeing you know it was a different different time frame then and I think that the, the parents were afraid also, and if they had to be supportive of their child and the child's gifts, then they would have to admit that this sort of thing exists, and it was easier to live, to co- cohabitate with the spiritual realm by ignoring that it was there because it was just too creepy to think about and, 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 and scary. So, um, you know, it, everybody would be sleeping with their lights on if, if they, if they, you know, kind of had to admit that to themselves back then. Um, and also, you know, they didn't want to be seen as different or crazy. So that, I think that that's part of the reason why parents back then were not as supportive of things as, as more of them are becoming enlightened and becoming more supportive now. Okay. Did you think of yourself as as having any psychological problems or crazy? No. Mm-mm. No, not not other than normal crazy. I mean, my friends might beg to differ, but, you know, they, it, it just, in, in, in a normal crazy way, like, like all of us are sometimes, in a, in a funny way. But, but no, no, I always, I always, um, I always knew that, that, that there was something more to what, there was even something more to religion. There was something more to the spiritual realm. I never really dabbled in, in any kind of like Ouija boards or anything, which I don't recommend anybody doing because um, that kind of opens a whole bunch of portals and, and channels of things that uh, you, you may not be able to close and may not be able to put back in there what comes through. So, um, but, it, but you know, back in that time frame too, there was always the – the black lights and the the, the, the wild um, posters on the wall and things like that and things that were kind of creepy, but yet people didn't go beyond beyond that, you know, as far as spirit, spiritual things or, or ghosty type type things. Even if things did happen, people didn't talk about it. I grew up in a household like that too, where where kids weren't acknowledged and and we just don't talk about those types of things. Everything was always small talk. You know, it sounds like you pretty much had the same way of growing up like I did. Yes, children were seen and not heard. Yes. Absolutely. So were were you not allowed to sit on certain furniture too? Yes. Oh, my gosh. We weren't allowed in the living room unless we were fresh out of the bathtub because the carpet was white and the couch was too. You know, who who in their right mind would put white carpeting and white couches in a house with kids? Hello. You know, I mean... Really, so yeah, yeah. nope. Our our place, not allowed our, to. our place where we were banned, where it was the living room and the dining room, not allowed to play there. Oh wow! No, nope. not allowed. Old Phyllis there, she would get she get a little cranky if she came home and saw my Hot Wheels in those areas, or or even heaven forbid, sitting on the couch reading a book. Oh, it was hell to pay. Right. <laughs> yeah, then it got yes, real paranormal. Thing. Yes, same thing, same thing. We had to stay playing in our rooms. There was a patio area that we could go out and play on, but we were not allowed to, like you said, play in the dining room or the kitchen or the family room for that matter um, when that got added on. So, yeah, same thing, same exact thing. Oh, goodness. I was allowed out of the room, 
but I just wasn't allowed, you know, in those couple of rooms there. It, it was difficult. It was it was very, very difficult. I'm not going to go any further than that. But we've only got about three and a half minutes before we have to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Author Lynn Monet is our guest tonight, her book, Omnipresent. Lynn, let's start to lead up to where we're going to go in the next half hour, and that's where you're going to introduce us to the haunted house that you lived in. What did you know about haunted houses previous to this home? Well, you know, I had been in denial so much after my childhood that also I was uh, had gotten into some kind of new agey religion that, that believed that, you know, universally that you couldn't be affected by these things, that, that it was universal law, you know, that did not allow these sorts of things. And I, of course, I had gone the Christian route also, and I felt that I was protected and and didn't believe in these sorts of things. So when this transpired, um, I was in denial for a very long time um, and rationalizing things. And my, my children and their friends were actually the ones that saw the things before, way before I was willing to admit it. Did you see any apparitions? In that house? No, pre- yes. previous to that, though. Not, not bad ones. I mean, I... Again, I would catch things out of the corner of my eye, and I mean, I would see them in full form. I could even tell you what they were wearing, because most of the time, spirits do show up in clothes. They don't show up naked. Um, well, I have had one show up naked. But anyway, um, but from, from, for the most part, they, they show up the way that you would remember them last or the way that they, they were on, on Earth before they passed. And a lot of times, they're busy doing the same old things that they were doing when they when they were embodied here, you know, the, the one thing about haunting that people don't think about is they always think of an old house as something that is haunted. But what I learned in all of this is that it's not the age of the house. It's the age of the ground that it's built on. So a brand new house can be haunted if the house is built in the wrong place. Well, you know what? We're going to learn more about that and and so much more from you because – when we come back from the break in about 90 seconds, we're getting into omnipresent. I got to learn about these ghosts. They've already cut off our phone line once, you know. Yes, they have. You know, <laughs> I, I got to tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a true story here. All right. I, I interviewed a guy named Anthony uh, Kenyatta a couple of years ago, like three, four years ago. And he has this haunted doll that he called Harold, who says is a, has the spawn of Satan inside of him. And he says to me, point blank, he goes, you know, Dave, sometimes there's weird stuff that happens during the show. Phones will hang up or whatever. And, you know, I've been through that. I mean, you know, Skype really isn't the isn't the best uh, phone line out there, but that's what we use. Long story mm-hmm. short, 45 minutes into the show, I see something out of the corner of my eye. So put my microphone on mute as Anthony starts speaking. I kind of turn my head ever so slowly, and there is a cloaked figure standing about a foot and a half from my shoulder at about four and a half, maybe five feet tall, very thin, much like if you would hang a, a, uh, a coat on like some, like on a child's hanger, you know, how it just be real small. And it stood there and then I disappeared. I I watched it disappear. So weird stuff has happened. Weird stuff has happened. Yeah. Yep. So let's just leave it there. Let's just leave it there. Okay, uh, because I kind of ate that time up. I apologize. I'm a big mouth. I'm a big mouth. <laughs> Lynn, you sit tight. We're going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Author Lynn Monet, her website, lynnmonet.com. Monet, M-O-N-E-T. She goes the French route there. Find her books on Amazon. I am omnipresent is what it's called. Let's find out about the haunted house from hell next, shall we? Let's do this thing together. Get in some ghosts. Paranormal. Some spooky stuff coming up next on the Mighty SOR. All right, we're clear. Okay, um, did you want to call me back on my phone, or do you want me to continue to stay on the cell phone? Uh, we're good right now, if you're okay with it. I am okay with it. I am. Um, you know, around... around um, um, Halloween every year, the the veil between 
our dimension and the other dimension gets very, very thin. So these spirits become much more active. So that's why I was mentioning, I'm not surprised that the phone got, they, they, they really don't want to be talked about. So. <laughs> oh, we're getting into we them. Like we're going to send some, we're going to send some Dave energy over to them because, uh, there you go. Bring it on. Yeah. Yeah. Bring it on. Am I coming out across okay? I'm you are coming around like, oh, beautifully. Beautifully. Perfect. Okay. Okay, good. Fabster, what the hell is going on, dude? Oh, uh, the Dodgers. Oh, yes, your Dodgers won the World Series, man. Yes, have a beer for Dave. You know, 32 years, man, 32 years since Tommy Lasorda put Kurt Gibson in in game one for that beautiful home run, and now you're winning the World Series again. Hey, Kevin, how are you? Thank you so much again for the super chat, Fapster. I really do appreciate that, man. All right. That's just amazing. Oh, it just fell down here. I knocked it down, though. Oh, sure. Aliens. Do you, do you got <laughs> aliens, too? You got some aliens over there? I have, I, I, I have in fact, seen aliens before um, in my practice as a nurse. Um, I have seen them. As a matter of fact, uh, Linda Moulton Howe was, uh, I was um, watching one of her, her podcasts, and asked her the question if, if, you know, she felt that aliens kind of are intermingling amongst us in human form. And she's like, why are you asking me that? So there's a little story with that, too. Um, well, we'll get into that at the yeah. back end of the show. I'll just ask okay. you. I'll, I'll, that last half hour, we'll change it up. and Because uh, I want to focus this next hour on uh, and a bit here on, on your book and on the experiences okay. you guys great. had. And then in, in, the, in the next hour, too, uh, we're going to take some audience questions there, so it'll be good. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I'm also writing a second book, by the way. Oh, nice. Yeah, this one is actually on the um, the act of um, of um, dying, death, and afterlife. Um, some of the things with my ability to see interdimensionally, the gifts that I've been left with that way. I've been able to see both sides of the veil as someone in a medical sense, as someone is actively transitioning into death, as well as what the preparations on the other side are with the loved ones that are awaiting the soul to cross over. So that this next book is, is about that. One second. That sounds excellent. When, when, do you, when do you plan on having that one out? Um, hopefully by fall of this coming year, uh, if not sooner. It all depends on how long copyright takes with this COVID right. thing. Right. Well, you make so sure you, you make longer. sure you let us know so Corrin's the booking guy can get you back on the show next year. Oh, I will definitely, definitely. And also, if you ever need to fill in, you feel free to call me. I don't mind. So, you know, if ever somebody cancels or something, and you want somebody to kind of. Because I've got a lot of stuff. I mean, in that book also, I have a chapter on mental illness, on addiction, on aliens. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. Absolutely. That's awesome. Uh, hold on. All right, we got about 45 seconds. Thank you to Fabster big time for the super chat. Really do appreciate that. Congratulations on your L.A. Dodgers winning the World Series. It's only been since, I think, I don't know, it's like 14 years and counting since my Yankees won. Don't like that. Don't like that at all. Uh, but you know what? Either way, it's going to be good. And, uh, yeah, big way to support this show. Give us a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Become one of our followers here on YouTube. We really appreciate it. 
And uh, yeah, you know, let's uh, so too much. let's do a little bit of radio show thing happening here. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. Here we go. Here we go with the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for tuning us in as we look to turn up the woo here on the show. I want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website spacedoutradio.com we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to bumblefoot and reading up on captain shirks sor newswire follow us on twitter at spaced out radio and on instagram at spaced out radio show tonight we are talking with author lynn monet we are talking about her book omnipresent which can be found on amazon major bookstores on google everywhere because she's damn good at what she does lynn welcome back Thank you so much. <laughs> Good to have you here. All right, let's. It's go, great to be here. <laughs> let's go back in time. Let's go back in time a little bit here, because you got some ghosts to tell us about, some spirits, demons, and everything. Let's go back to when mm-hmm. you moved into that house. How did that all come down? Okay, um, let's see. I, it was in March of two thousand five. Um, after a year-long search, I was a single mom on a single mom income. Um, I got a call from my realtor who called me and said that this house had just been listed, this house was just being processed through her office. A colleague of hers had just come back from taking pictures of this house, and it hadn't even been listed on the MLS yet. And her words should have resonated with me when she said to me that this house was in my price range and that it was just almost too good to be true. So she had asked me to meet her at her office, and I quickly went over there, and we um, drove to the new uh, to the home, and she had given me these papers to look through with the pictures of the house and everything. And it was this 2,400-square-foot um, brick two-story split-level house with three-bedroom, two-bath on the main floor, di- you know, formal dining room, living room, nice kitchen with a nook. And then downstairs in the lower level, there was a large family room with a stone fireplace and a bonus room. It was like a 15 by 13 bonus room and a double-car garage that literally could fit three cars in it if you were to line them up and a workshop. Beautiful, beautiful home on a half-acre floor to flat lot. And it just had so many things that I, I kept asking her. I said, you know, did, did possibly the listing agent make a mistake on this price? Because this house could easily have sold for $100,000 more than what was being asked. And um, in addition to that, the realtor was telling me on the way there that the family that was selling the house had already moved out. So this was great. It made it move in ready. And that um, they were wanting to sell the house because the husband had to transfer to another area for his work and that they were not wanting to have to continue to pay for two homes. Um, and so, again, this, this made it great as well. So when we, um, as we were driving to the house, you know, I kept asking questions. I thought, oh, my gosh, for this price. I asked her, I said, will you please call and see if it's next to a dump? Or maybe, you know, the, the neighbors have a, a sinkhole in their yard, or maybe it's near a stinky paper mill and the whole air, the whole neighborhood smells bad. And it was none of those things. It was this beautiful home. When we turned in on the street, it was a dead-end um, street. It was in a what I call a trick-or-treat neighborhood, which, you know, puts the houses close enough that the kids can go from house to house and get a lot of candy, but yet... You know, if you're sitting in your breakfast nook and you reach out your arm, you're not going to touch the side of the neighbor's house. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. And I'm like, does this house have indoor plumbing? I kept trying to rationalize how this house could be such a low price in an excellent area, excellent schools, low taxes. It was just really too good to be true. So when we when we pulled into the driveway, this house was more than I could even have hoped for i so many houses that i had looked for on my income they needed repair
repairs. They were in not in a not so great area. And this house is one of those things. It was it was beautiful. So um, as we we went up to the door and the realtor got the those the keys out of the lockbox and was trying to put them into the lock, she kept having trouble. And she thought at first that maybe that they had put the wrong keys in the lockbox. And finally, every time she would, it seemed like every time she would open her mouth to say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to have to let the, the, the other realtor know that they left the wrong keys. And then she'd try one more time, and then the lock would open. And, of course, the key turns out to be a key piece throughout um, all of the time that I owned the house that, that seemed to be a problem, and there's a reason. Um, so, anyway, she finally was able to open the door. And as I entered into the foyer, it being a split-level house, there um, were stairs descending and ascending, um, and I decided to go up the ascending stairs to the main level to look the house first. And the realtor's having trouble now getting the key back out of the lock or getting it any, getting it to, to turn or anything. So I'm just kind of at the top of the stairs waiting for her. But as I am transitioning up those stairs, I, I, um, I can clearly see out of my peripheral vision a young man hanging in the stairwell oh, and of course yeah and of course it, i was taken back it, he was hanging there was a, a wrought iron railing over the descending stairs um that you would come up and meet with with the ascending stairs it was part of the railing and he was hanging from that and i remember catching this view and i remember thinking to myself you know, why Why on earth would I even be thinking of something so horrible? Uh, you know, is that why would something like that even pop into my mind? And then it turned out after I had bought the house, the next door neighbor who had lived on the street, it was the very first house on the street, even before the road was paved. And he was there when that house was built, told me that the original owner's son had, in fact, hung himself in the stairwell of that house oh, while his parents were in an active divorce and the mother came home from work and found him so this this did happen um i it, i this is what i saw so the um the realtor i didn't think of it again the realtor walked me through the house and of course um i was just enamored with the house um, i i wanted to make an offer that day because i realized you know how many times i had gone and I looked at a house and I thought, well, you know, I want to take a week to think about it. And then when I'd go back, it would be gone. So I didn't want to do that with this house. This was beyond my wildest dreams. But I did want to bring back my children that afternoon and have them walk through it with me. So she agreed to meet me again that afternoon at the house uh, at around 3 o'clock. And I went and picked up my children from school and I brought them with me. And, of course, they're all excited. How much longer till we get there? And we pulled in and um, they got out of the car they're running around the yard and of course the realtor pulls up and again we have problems with that lock but then we finally got into the house and um, as she and I are standing there talking the kids are running down the hallway picking out their bedrooms and I noticed that there was a about five or six realtors cards on the counter so the house had been listed on the MLS by then and people were actively showing it so after my kids had run all through the the upstairs part of the house, they asked if they could go downstairs. Now, my, my son was seven at the time, and my daughter was 13. So they went down the stairs, and within about five minutes, my daughter was back, and she said to me, she said, Mommy, I do not want to move here. And at first I thought that I didn't hear her, and she, I asked her, I said, what did you say? And she repeated it again, and I said, well, how could you not? You know, we've been living in a single wide trailer all this time with practically no yard. How could you not want to move in here? And she told me, she said, there is something weird about this house, and I do not want to live here. Oh, goodness. Well, of course, I should, yeah, I should have listened, but, as, um, but, but I, I didn't. But as a parent in that, and I can see why, because as a parent in that situation, you're thinking, okay, kids at that... Th when especially teenage daughters at that point, at that age, they start to get, oh, mm -hmm. you know, they start to get all all flustered, like things aren't good enough for them. And here you are as a single mom, and you're like, this is my dream house. I can afford this. Like, that is a conundrum for you as a mom to be in. 
Right. And I mean, I was so proud thinking with a single parent income that I could provide something so wonderful for my family. And I agree with you. I And, and, I, and I was thinking, too, that her reasoning might be because now all of a sudden it hit home that she was going to be moving away from her friends. And, um, you know, I even tried to console her with the fact that, well, we're only 20, 25 minutes away and you can bring them for the weekend. They can camp out and then we'll take them home. So, but she was at it, you know, she was, she was really adamant about it. And I was actually very embarrassed because I'm standing here with the realtor. This poor woman has drugged me around for over a year looking for a house and now all of a sudden my, my daughter's standing there saying that she does not like the house. So I, I told my daughter, I said, well, this is not a decision for you to make. And I went ahead and I said a prayer and I said, you know, I'm going to make an offer on this house. I also found out that someone else that day had made an offer on the house. So I just said a prayer. I said, if it's meant to be mine, then they'll take my offer and I will get it. And lo and behold, the next morning, I did get the call that the that the um, seller had accepted my offer. So, of course, I'm dancing around the house. I'm thrilled, you know, um, and, you know, all of the things that go, the emotion and things that go with that. But um, moving, moving ahead, when the day came for the closing, um, I found that it was very odd that the couple, when they arrived, it turned out that they had not moved far away for his job he was still working in the same place they were just living to, you know 10 minutes from where the house was with one of their one of their parents either hers or his with their children and and there, it, there was the story that I had originally been told didn't even apply and I was talking to them and I was so thrilled and I'm like well I'm going to go ahead and have some wooden flooring put in because that light colored carp is just not going to go with kids. And, and the wife would not look at me. She was stared at her feet the whole time. She would not make eye contact with me. And I even at one point kind of tried to bend to my side to, to look her in the face and get her attention. And when I told her that I was putting in the wooden flooring, she said to me, that's what we wanted to do and still continued to stare at her feet. So with that being said, I, I know they knew. She had I some know guilt. That they knew. She had some guilt yes. that she was that as probably a mom herself that she was she probably had some guilt that she was putting you and your children in some sort of danger. And you know, Absolutely. unfortunately, money is the root of all evil, pun intended, in this situation. Exactly. And you know, the thing is, is on the flip side of that, I've had. People that have heard me <clears throat> on the radio and they come back with comments like, how could you possibly have sold the house to somebody? And it, it is written in my book, and I will go ahead and I'll say this. Yes, I did sell the house. However, the people on the flip side that I sold the house to, I was honest and asked them if they believed in ghosts because it, it something occurred um, <clears throat> The wife was coming out of the of the um, coming from the main level to the to the foyer to leave out of the double entry doors of this house, and I overheard her say to her husband, "Why did you push me?" And he said to her, "He said I, I I didn't push you." And she said, "Yes, you did." And he said, "I am three steps back from you. I I did not push you." And she said, "Well, I don't know what happened." Well, of course I knew what it was. So I went ahead and they came out the door and I said to them, I said, um, do you believe in ghosts? And they immediately cut me off and they said, no, nope, we're Baptists. We don't talk about those sorts of things. We don't believe in those sorts of things and we're protected. I said, okay. You know, I, I, I would have told them the truth if they had asked me. So I just want to get that up front. I didn't stick somebody with a house and I had truly, truly hoped with all of what I had had done in that house to try to take care of the issue, that finally it would have worked and that these people, maybe since they weren't as sensitive as I was or, or, or multiple things, maybe their religion was more protective for them, that they would have a good, happy, long life in that home. That was my intention. But I also knew that I couldn't sell it to a family with children because there were some other things that had occurred. There was so much that happened in that house. And just to, to, to throw in a little something, I, I want to tell everyone, I only spent two nights in that house. 
I owned it for eight months. I only slept there twice. And people say, oh, well, my goodness, you know, they, they think that I only lived there for two days. But what actually happened was is after when we closed on the house, it was in March of 2005. So my children were going to be getting out of school in May. And I didn't want to, with that only eight weeks left of school, I didn't want to transfer them to the new school with, you know, risking their papers getting lost and things like that. And since it was only a 20, 25 minute commute, I went ahead and um, we stayed living where we were and they finished up school while I went ahead and had renovations done on the house. And we were planning on moving in in the summer so that, you know, they could meet kids in the neighborhood and start fresh that year, you know, in the fall um, and not have to be dropped into school in the middle, you know, in the the tail end of the year. So, um, but it was during that time between March and May, the end of May, that we actually did spend two nights there, and um, some pretty pretty dramatic things happened, and that's that's why we ended up not uh, um, staying there. We have my furniture was totally moved in at one point, but um, everything got moved back out. You couldn't handle it. No. Do you think that? No, was- you know. Do you think that was sorry, in in part because you were playing a dual role as mom and dad and, and you, you're extra protective of your children at that point? Well, the things that happened, and just a little, a little blurb, there were some physical things that were happening. Um, the worst thing that happened in that house is my very best friend was clawed to the point of bleeding on her stomach and her back while she stood next to me in the kitchen of that house. And I had 13 different denominations of religion come to the house. I had Catholic priests. That poor man, he, he was so frightened in that house that he was shaking. His, his Bible almost fell out of his hand, and he literally went, ran down the hallway squirting holy water into the bedrooms, and we were done in 10 minutes. He didn't say a word. I drove him back. And he couldn't get out of the car fast enough. He almost fell getting out of the car. Bless his heart. But he was so scared that the the actual blessing was in, not effective because these demons feed on that type of negative energy of fear and anger and depression and all of those things that they that they like to hang on to so that they can increase their abilities and draw on that negativity. But um the, the, one, the one thing that was the turning point for me was that I had a paranormal group from Georgia, well, um, in I, the I, USA. I, I want you to save that part because I want to go into that in hour two okay. about the paranormal groups. Because, you know, we've heard so many times from people such as yourself who've been guests on this show that have absolutely been railroaded by these paranormal teams, you know, charging money and, you know, stirring it up even worse than it's ever been. I want you to hold off on that because we could go in in a long ways on that. And I think it's important uh, because we only got about five minutes before we go to break here. I think it's important Mm -hmm. that we we get a lot of time in on that because for a lot of people out there who may be in your shoes or looking at Mm -hmm. buying a house or, or whatever, you know, they may need to know what you went through, and why you just don't call up the first paranormal team that's on Google when you search it. Exactly. So Exactly. And I want to hold yep. off on that. And, okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm not trying to, to, to you know, no, no, kind no, of kill no, the story. That, I... But let's let's go back a little bit in time, Lynn. Lynn Monet is our guest okay. tonight. Let's go back in time to you, you buy the house. You're all excited. You, you move your furniture in. What's the first thing that happens? Well, um, it was even before the furniture moved in. Of course, I had made mention about the thing with my daughter. But after we had closed on the house, we went over that first evening um, to uh, to have dinner. Have I brought taco making. So we were going to have a floor picnic since none of our fer- furniture was going to be moved in until more towards the summer. And um, so as I'm preparing the dinner in the kitchen, my, my daughter comes to me and stands in the doorway. And she said, what did you want? And I said, I didn't call you. And she said, yes, you did. And I said, no, I didn't call you. I swear I didn't call you. And she said, I swear you did. And then, of course, my son, who's seven, comes in, and he's now peering into the kitchen underneath my daughter's arm. And he said, yes, you did, Mommy. I heard you call her, too. 
And so, and of course, and I hadn't. So I, I rationalized it, and I said, "Well, you know, Brittany is a popular name. Perhaps, you know, it's dinner time. There's another mom out in the front yard calling for her Brittany to come home and eat. And I'm sure that when we meet this Brittany, that she'll make a nice friend for you." And I just kind of rationalized it. So <clears throat> we packed up after dinner um, and left. I had also decided to um, pull some carpeting out on my own to save money. I wanted to be able to have money to put on a better quality of flooring. So I knew that I would need to do some of the work myself instead of paying for it. So I was ripping out carpet. But anyway, um, the very next day, I dropped my children off at school and I came back to the house. And when I walked in, I went up the stairs to the main room, went to the kitchen and put my purse down and I started to look around and I noticed that the other light was on and that the stove light was on and that the light overhead was on and I thought well I you know I don't remember leaving any of this on yesterday but maybe one of the kids ran back in and turned the light on and I just didn't notice so then I start going down the hallway and every single room had the light on every single room now there was no furniture yet so these were all ceiling fixtures and um and I thought to myself okay wait a minute now I know I did not leave all these lights on, and I know when I left that the house was dark. So I thought maybe that a neighbor had been entrusted with a key. So I went across the street. I introduced myself. I asked the the new neighbors if um, you know if anybody had been that they knew of that had been entrusted with a key, and they said no. And I explained that uh, that all the lights were on in the house, and and did they notice any lights on in the house tonight? you know, the night before, and they had said that they had taken a walk, and of course it was around still like daylight savings time, and uh, um, or whatnot, they, the, the time frame where, where it was still kind of light later into the, to the evening, and they had taken their walk, and they noticed that the walkway lights were on, but those are solar lights, so they would come on by themselves when it got dark enough, but the, they said that there were no lights on inside of the house, so I thought, well... You know, this house sold so fast, maybe a realtor didn't realize that it had been sold and came in and showed it before I got here and left the lights on or was prepping it for for showing. So it, I figured that eventually I would figure out why the lights were on. Maybe they were on timers. This was a new house to me. You know, I didn't know, but I knew I was going to figure it out. So I went in and I started to pull up carpeting, and it was not a big deal. And I went ahead and I left that day, but I went all through the house and made sure this time that every single light was turned off. And when I went to leave, I, I was having trouble getting the deadbolt to turn in the lock. So finally, I ended up having to, to open the door and hand lock the knob lock and, and shut it in order to leave. So I left, picked up my kids, dropped my kids back off at school the next day, came back by myself. And when I went to put the key into the, into the, the knob lock, the door just opened. And I mean, I didn't even turn the key. I didn't turn oh, the knob. Goodness. I didn't anything. The door just opened mm. inward. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe I didn't have it pulled into the door jam right. tight enough. And that's why I was having trouble with getting the deadbolt to turn. Mm. Right. And so again, I rationalized it. So I go into the house and I go upstairs and into the kitchen. I, I've um, got a little bit more carpeting to pull up and I wanted to um, with the carpeting out, wanted to put a fresh coat of paint on the ceiling because it didn't look like they, it, the house was built in 1976 and didn't look like the ceilings had been freshened up since then. So um, Hold that thought right there, okay? That's a good place okay. to end it. So when we come back, we're okay. going to find out about the ceilings that you want to paint and why this, this uh, spirit had a real, real anger or obsession with the carpet in the house. Lynn Monet is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio, The Haunted House from Hell. Her book, Omnipresent, available on Amazon. LynnMonet.com is the website. We'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio coming up right after this. I love how you paint a picture. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, I'm just on the edge of my seat. I'm just going to run my dogs outside. I'll be right back, okay? Okay, thank you. 
talk shows covering UFOs, <coughs> ghosts, Be right back. strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR space traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajons.com. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines Report. We are independent and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines Report. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Tribe and Tribe Cheerleaders. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little different. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Space Out Radio's official charity, Tribe Charities, just go to tribecharities.org forward slash donate. Hi, this is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother Is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother Is Watching. All right, Lynn, I'm back. The SLR vault is open for business. And okay. Let me just throw my headphones on here. We got like two and a half minutes. Okay, great. Yeah, having fun yet? Yes, I'm having a great time. Now, how much longer do we have? Because I want to know where the leeway is, because I can, after this, kind of bring it into more when the when the um, activity just really increases. Well, well, we'll get into that, and then we'll get into the paranormal stuff. Like paranormal. Teams. Okay, I mean, how how much more how much more time do we have though? Is it an hour? Oh, we have an hour and a half left with you. Perfect, perfect. Okay, good. Yes, I'm excited. Yeah, also I wanted to make mention too. You know, at the end of my book, um, not only guides parents with their children, but there's also a self self help section in the back with a way that people can determine before signing on the dotted line before moving in to a home, which is much easier to avoid moving into a haunted place than having to 
sign on the dotted line with a mortgage for 30 years and then get out. Yes. So this is a it has a step by step um, way to determine whether the house has unwanted guests into it or your business place before you actually sign on the dotted line. You know what? I I actually it's funny that you you mentioned that because I just contacted my buddy who's a realtor in town and I'm like, dude, I said I don't care how long it takes. I want you to find me the most haunted piece of property here in town where I live. I want, really? Oh yeah, I'm gonna. I got I got big plans to turn it into the S O R haunted pair, uh, bread and breakfast. Oh, good. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Well, um, you and I can you can I you and I can talk off radio, and I can definitely give you some pointers. Or, and you probably already know, but oh, I'm yeah. just saying there there are some simple ways to determine that. And um, yeah, I'm, there you I, go. I'm I'm pretty astute with that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I figured you were so. But for people that aren't, I mean, that, that helps out section is very simple and easy to use. <clears throat> Anybody can use it, and they can determine, you know, whether there is something in the house or not. All right, my friend, hold on. Here, without, here, here, here we go. You are listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. And on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Let's find it here. Hocus Pocus. Hocus Pocus is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. And on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we are talking with author Lynn Monet. LynnMonet.com is her website. She's got a true book called Omnipresent. And this tells about real tales of a house she bought that was completely haunted and demonic. Lynn, welcome back. Thank you so much. So um, right, right before we... the break, you were talking about... Mm -hmm. You were ripping up the carpets. You wanted to paint the ceiling, and weird stuff started happening. Yes. Um, that particular day, I'd gone back. My kids were not with me. Um, of course, the door opened itself, basically, when I went into the house. But the, the main thing that, that caught my attention was after I had put my purse down in the kitchen, I had walked to the sliding glass doors to open them because I wanted to aerate the house while I'm painting, and I noticed that the pin was dangling to the side, and the actual sliding glass door itself was unlocked. And I thought, to, I thought to myself, I could have sworn that I remembered that key, be, you know, the pin being in its place. But I thought again, you know, maybe one of my kids ran back and and just didn't mention it, or I didn't notice it. I'm rationalizing again until I got downstairs into the garage area. Um, because both of the garage doors were also unlocked. But again, I thought, well, you know, I'm used to having a little clicky thing, not these manual jobbies, and maybe I unlocked it thinking that I was locking it. But there was a workshop inside of the garage, and I had come the day before, and I had piled boxes. Um, I am five foot nine. These boxes came up to my chin, and they were at least three feet out from this door that I had shoved them up against. And I'm looking at the door, and the chain lock is dangling to the side. And I'm like, uh-uh. I remember that being locked. And the only way that that could be unlocked is if somebody was on the inside of this house, moved these boxes, unchained the door, and then pushed the boxes back where I had them. So at this point, I was certain now that somebody in the neighborhood had a key. So I went back across the street to the neighbors, told them, that, you know, that every single peripheral door in that house was unlocked. Um, and that uh, had, had they noticed anyone 
over there or any kids playing in the yard after I had left? And they said no, and I gave them my telephone number. I said, you know, I'm not going to be changing the locks on the house right now because we're not moving in until the summer. But I have a lot, and I have a lot of workers that are going to be coming back and forth, so I'll change the lock when they're finished. But if you notice anybody in the yard, I want you to call me. And if, and if I tell you to call the police, I want you to call the police, and I'm on my way. I'll be there in 20, 25 minutes. And they agreed to do that. And the lady said to me, she said, well, I'm not trying to be a nosy neighbor, but I did notice when you left yesterday that you were having trouble locking that front door. She said, as a matter of fact, you walked halfway to your car and doubled back and went and shook the knob. She said it before you left then and got into your car. And, of course, I had forgotten doing that. But when she mentioned it, I then remembered. And so, of course, you know, this whole thing with it opening on its own, it, it didn't make sense. But um, so I went back into the house. Um, I had finished the, the rug. I was getting starting to paint the ceiling. And um, also I might add that I had um, four different workers come into the house. And um, the first three wouldn't stay, would not return to the house after after a day of being in there um, when they started putting in the wooden flooring. And, and uh, I didn't get to find out until the third one of which that would actually happen. But um, anyway, um, so just to kind of move forward a little bit here, a lot of things happened in this house. A lot, a lot of things happened. But this, when things kind of started to amp up was when we actually spent um, the two nights there that we did. Um, on the first night, my daughter had asked if she could have her friend come along and do a sleepover with her. So I brought along, you know, queen size blow up mattresses. I put one in her room and one in the master bedroom. And, and, um, so, um, my daughter and her friend, um, you know, was doing a sleepover and this girl had slept over with us many times before. And about one o'clock in the morning, she didn't want to stay anymore. She wanted to go home. And my daughter said um, that she had gone into the kitchen and to get some Oreos and that something scared her in there and that she wouldn't even go into the bathroom without my daughter tagging along with her and that she was wanted, you know, she was adamant about leaving and going home. So um, I um, had the girl, you know, call her parents. And, of course, the parents didn't want to come and get her at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning and convinced her to, you know, to stay until the morning. And um, so um, we then left. But a couple of days later, my kids wanted to go back and do a sleepover again. So this time it was just us, and we brought my dog this time. We had a little schnauzer named Sally. And Sally would not go in that house. She balked at the door, I mean, so hard that her, that her collar came over her head. And I thought, well, maybe she's got to go to the bathroom. So I hooked her up to the tree out front and let her you know, run around out there on her, on her lead. And, and, um, but when it came time to bring her back in, I literally had to pick her up and carry her into the house. And, um, and so, and she was literally darting around the house looking for an exit. And of course something happened in the house with her and my children on that day that I didn't find out until later. But, um, so that evening, um, I had both of the, the blow up mattresses in the master bedroom, my son was on one, my daughter was on the other, and they, they had a little VCR TV in the middle. Um, they had brought Hidalgo to watch, and they had kind of fallen asleep. And I'm like, you know, everything is half done. I want something finished that I can walk into and that it's done. So I decided to paint the, the master bedroom bathroom because it was small. I knew I could do it in, in, in a couple of hours and be done. And so I did, and it was about 11 o'clock when I finished, and it was low fume paint. But when I'm in the bathroom with the door shut so that the paint, even though it's low fume, I didn't want it to come out and affect my children, and the windows were open in there too. But I heard my dog growling, and I thought, well, that's strange. So I thought maybe she needed, you know, to go outside, and, and maybe because the doors were, you know, the windows were open, that she was hearing, hearing the raccoons and stuff, which where we were living before, we couldn't have the windows open because it was a luxury and then it would be in, in where we were living. It was more of an invitation than a luxury. So we had to always keep things closed. And so um, I took her out and again, she bulked at coming back into the house and I went down to the kitchen with my paintbrushes and I was cleaning up the paint. And 
when I came back out of the kitchen, as I was crossing in front of the, the wrought iron railing, because where you would come out of the kitchen to your to your right was a wrought iron railing, which was where the young man had hung himself from, to keep you from going over to the into the descending stairs. And then there were stairs in front of me. To my left was a big, large living room, and if you continued forward, you'd go into a hallway that would take you into the three bedrooms and, and the two bathrooms. So as I'm coming out of the kitchen, I get to about midway on, on the railing, which was about four feet in length, and I catch out of my peripheral vision this thing that shot up the stairs across the double entry doors up the stairs in front of me and shot down the hallway. And I stood there frozen. This thing was not from this earth. It, it appeared to be um, standing on its, it was, it was an animal, an animal looking thing, um, almost a wolf like looking thing, but the, the, the nose, the way that it narrowed, it had very large nose holes like a horse. So the, the nose holes actually almost took up the whole end of the, the nose part of the face. And it had rabbit-type ears that were long, but they weren't on the top of its head. It was on each side of its head, turned backwards, skimming over its shoulders, for lack of a better word, like, like the FTD van. Um, it had them on the sides, and they, they were long. And it was kind of hunched. Its feet were going so rapid underneath it that you could just see a fluttering motion, but it stood up on its haunches. And when it came up to the top of the stairs, and I am frozen, I am ready to wet my pants. I'm standing there, this thing, I am five foot nine. It, it was probably around five foot seven or six. It was a little shorter than me. And it just, it had these like skinny little arms and, and, lay, and, and, and hands with long, nasty looking nails. And it shot down the hallway in front of me, and I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, okay, I've been painting in fumes. It's been a while since I've eaten anything. Maybe my blood sugar is low. You know, I'm trying to rationalize what I've seen because this just did not make sense. It, it could not be real. So I started to rationalize thinking that maybe a motorcycle or bicycle had gone under a street light and because not all of the windows had window dressings on them yet at that point that it created that weird kind of you know rounding through different than a car would make but then it didn't make sense because there was no way that it could have come up and crossed across the front doors and then up and then down in front of me and then all of a sudden I hear my dog Sally growling but it was a different kind of growl than I had ever heard her do it was it, I mean it was bone chilling um she was growling in this way and so immediately kind of snapped me out of my my funk of what I was trying to rationalize as seeing and um I went down to the master bedroom where my kids were sleeping and my dog was fixated on that door opening she was standing in the master bedroom, fixated on the door that went into the hallway. And, of course, this is the direction that that thing just shot down. So I walk into the room, and I kind of pet her on the head to calm her. And she only puts her ears back for a quick second, and then she's still standing there just growling at that doorway with her hair up on her neck. And, uh, and again, I thought, maybe she needs to go out. So I took her out again. Same issue with not wanting to come into the house, but... Finally, when I brought her in the house, she shot down the hallway and nestled in between the two kids on the mattresses. And I took a shower, and I crawled in with my kids. And I'm like, move over. I'm getting in. But then the next morning when we woke up, I asked my daughter, I said, how did you, you know, how did you sleep last night? And she said, I didn't. She said, I felt like something was staring at me from that doorway all night long. And then my son, when he woke up, um, he had also taken a bath the night before, and he had on his Thomas engine pajamas that were shorts and a top or something like that. And um, when he got up, he had bite marks on his legs. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. He had three individual bite marks of upper and lower teeth. They looked like dog bite marks, although my dog, if it 
she was not prone to biting. And if it had been her that had bitten him, the mouth span would have been larger and the width of the teeth would have been larger. And these were, these were purple, purple bruises, and you could literally count the teeth of the upper and the lower part of the teeth. And my son had them, one on each leg in the thigh area, and then a third one lower down on his, he had two of them on his right leg, um, one lower down on his right leg. And when he got up, I said to him, I said, Austin, oh, my God, you've got bite marks on your legs. What happened? And he's looking at him, he's touching him, he says, I don't know. And I said, did Sally bite you? And he said, no, and he's touching him still. And I'm like, do you, re-? I, and I thought, you know, I asked him, I said, were you playing with your dinosaur? I thought maybe his plastic dinosaur thing, you know, he was playing with maybe jabbing it on his leg, but his dinosaur wasn't even with us. So it wasn't that either. So um, we, of course, uh, packed up that morning and um, um, I, I went to load Sally in the car. I was coming back to, to get the kids and lo and behold, boy, the kids were dressed and out the door. And my daughter says to me, I've already locked the door. Here's your purse. You know, she says, can we go get something to eat? And they were ready to go in fi- literally like five or 10 minutes. They were fully dressed and ready for school to go. And um, we didn't really talk much more about it, but, you know, it was very concerning about those, those bite marks. And no kidding. As things can, yes, yes. Um, now, I have, um, to, I, I have yeah. to ask you right there, as a single mom, and I've been a single dad before, and I know that, you know, w- when something happens to your child, you're enraged mm-hmm. double time, right? Because yes. you want to be, you're, you're like the mama bear, I was like the papa bear, and it's like, okay, something hurt my child, you know, like you're, you're fit to kill at this point, I bet. Yes, I was. And, you know, the thing was is that, again, I was trying to find out what caused it. Right. You know, and there was nothing reasonable that it caused it. So, um, and I guess all of this comes together as I start getting information on things. But, and the fact was is that he had no idea where they came from. And, I mean, something that would be able to leave bruises like that on somebody, they would have felt it. So it was something that occurred during the night because of the way that the teeth prints were like that purple bruising. Um, but, of course, I'm thinking, uh, you know, he's a boy. You know, I, I kept trying to rationalize because nothing made sense. So it wasn't until, um, I, as I had said, I had multiple workers coming, and I had <clears throat> one worker in particular, um, the first two, um, the guy before I even hired him told me that uh, he was in between jobs and that he, if, if another job opened up, that he would be going to do that. And that's kind of what happened. So that made sense when I contacted him and I came and the flooring wasn't done. The second guy came over, flooring wasn't done after a weekend of where he was supposed to be there finishing it. And I couldn't get a hold of him. And finally I did. And he had the reasoning that somebody was in, a family member was in the hospital. Of course, that made sense. But this guy left his DeWalt tools, and he never came back and got them. Um, I, he told me to sit them out in front of the garage in a box, and they sat there for three weeks, and he never picked them up. And neither of these two guys ever came back to be paid. So I was getting desperate because it was getting closer to time um, to actually move in. I had now sold the place that I was living, and I had 30 days to get out. So um, I, uh, a friend of mine at work had a cousin that was out of work at the time, and, and he was handy that way, um, you know, able to do things in the house. And I asked her if he could help me, so he agreed to come over and help me. And this is when I finally was able to find out what was happening in the house with the, with the workers. Um, this particular day, I was in the house while he was there. I was in the hallway uh, paralleling my son's bedroom where the young man was putting in, starting with the, with the tongue and groove um, flooring, putting it in. And um, I was painting the hallway. And as I turned, in my peripheral vision, I had view of the um, stairs coming up to the main level. And there, what I saw as clear as I could see, you know, like you standing in front of me, this man, this young man walking up my stairs. And he was so real. I turned and I said, did you knock? 
because I thought that it was some person that, that maybe had knocked and we didn't hear him, so he opened the door and walked in. And then when I turned and I looked directly at the stairs, there was nothing there. And I realized in that moment that, you know, it was a ghost. And um, the, the young guy in the, in the bedroom putting down the, the floor and said, oh, no, I just dropped something. He thought when I asked, did you knock, was it that I was talking to him. So, of course, this kind of spooked me and creeped me out because um, As it now I've acknowledged yeah, that, that is, there is, in fact, a ghost in the house. And um, I, I, so I gathered my things, and I, I left. I left to, to go pick up my kids, and while I'm in the car line, I get a call from this guy who's putting flooring in my house. And he says to me, I have to leave. I have to leave right now. He says, there's something weird about this house that I've never experienced before, and the line dropped. So I'm trying to call him back and call him back for almost an hour. And I can't get a hold of him. And finally, I get a hold of him. And he's like, oh, it was nothing. But I'd rather be there when you're going to be there. And I explained to him that I wasn't coming back because that weekend I was I was a nurse working a bailer ship. So I worked every weekend. And I had Monday through Friday off to be home with my kids. And um, so I told him, I said, you know, I'm not coming back until Tuesday. My son's got Little League Monday. Friday, I'm going to be gone through Tuesday, and um, and I found at that point in time that he had not secured the house, and also some of the windows had been left open, and two of them had these oblong um, air conditioners in them, so there were no screens over the top, so there was a whole area of about two feet where it was open, open. So I had asked my friend Ellen, and we'll go back to him in a minute him in a minute because there were some things that happened but so I went home and I asked my neighbor Ellen I said um I've got to go back to my house to secure it um would you mind riding along with me because I didn't want to go back by myself because after seeing the ghost I was still weirded out so um she agreed to go with me and as we're driving along down the road I said to her I said do you believe in ghosts and she said oh hell yeah I believe in ghosts and I said well good because I think there's one in this house I said, so when we get there, um, if you don't feel comfortable coming in with me, because I needed somebody to help me pull the air conditioners in so that the windows could be shut and secured. I said, I'll go across the street and I'll get the neighbor's husband and see if he'll come in and help me. But I really appreciate you going with me, you know, at nighttime and going there. So she said, oh, no, I don't mind going in with you. So when we got there, um, again, the, the key was a problem. This time the key was stuck on me. So I, I mean, stuck that I had put it in and I couldn't get it to turn. And then finally, when I got the door open, I couldn't get the key back out. And Ellen walks into the foyer and she just turns to me and she looks at me and she starts to make a joke. And she says, what are you going to do? She says, you're not going to leave me here and let the boogeyman get me. Well, those things targeted her. And um, the key just like came out of that lock so fast that they almost fell to the ground out of my hand. And. So we went in, we, we pulled the air conditioners in, secured the windows. And, of course, I kind of wanted to show her around a little bit. You know, this was her first time there. I was proud of the house. And my daughter had um, wanted to have a wild horse-themed bedroom. So I had asked Ellen to come into the kitchen with me because I had gotten these really, really cool um, wooden carved horse heads to hang balances over my daughter's window with. And I wanted to show them to her, and she was holding one in each of her hands. Well, as we're standing there in the kitchen, I'm hearing this gurgling sound. It almost sounds like a didgeridoo, um, but it's this buzzing electrical sound that I had heard before when a demon had approached me in the house. And right. this is all, there's so much more in the book besides just this. But anyway, so we're standing there, and all of a sudden, Ellen says to me, and I don't say anything because I'm thinking that I'm the only one that's hearing the sound. Hold it, so hold it, hold that thought right there because we are going to step out for a break here at the bottom of the hour. Author Lynn Monet, her book Omnipresent, the real story of what it's like to live in a house from hell. On Spaced Out Radio continues after this. Oh, this is good. This is good stuff. 
You're making this is me, where she gets clawed. You're, you're making me look good here. Thank you. <laughs> you're making me look good. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, you know, as Captain and Tennille saying, you know, love will keep us together. <laughs> there you go. Mm-hmm. That was actually a pretty good song. I liked Captain and Tennille. <laughs> Well, let me try something here. Hold on. <clears throat> See if that works. Yeah, you stopped, stopped at a good point because this is where she gets clawed. All right. Well, we're soon going <laughs> to learn about it. We are soon mm -hmm. going to learn about it. Hey, you know what? I'm looking at myself on YouTube. My my hair isn't looking too bad. <laughs> Having a good hair night here tonight. You've got great hair, great hair anyway. No, I've it's true. seen your pictures. I've seen your it's true. I, you, I, you, you definitely have great hair. I can't even deny that. I can't even deny that. I'm sure your bald friends hate you. Uh, they bug me. <laughs> they bug me about it. My... <laughs> I have a few friends who are jealous. I'm sure. Between uh, my three best friends here in my town, all mm -hmm. three of them would ha have less hair than me. If you combine them. I believe that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Anyhow. <laughs> enough me. about that. Enough about that. This is an awesome story, man. I'm glad. I hope that you're getting some good feedback in the... Um... Uh, that that roll down thing where people comment. I hope. Oh yeah. You know that you're okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely uh, an awful time. Actually, <laughs> it was it was terrible. All right. But it's a good Halloween story. Oh, uh, no, you're, I, I'm loving this. I am absolutely loving this. I'm like, that's this is exactly the reason why I told you I did not want to hear anything before the show. I, you know, I did very little studying. I just wanted this one to come, you know, fresh off the mind with everything that is going on. And damn it, I'm, I, I, I called this one right. I called this one right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yes. No problem. We have about uh, two and a quarter minutes. Uh, the audience says okay. uh, that if you want to come join the chat room and say hello to them, uh, they, they'd be okay with that. They're kind of liking you. Okay. Oh, I'm glad. Um, how do I even get to that? Because... Right now, I'm sitting in my living room. Uh, don't worry. Oh, don't worry about it. If you're comfy, don't worry about it. You can do it after the show. I'll show you how after the show. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. I, 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 that would be great. Yeah, we'll worry about it then. Sounds good. No problem. We have uh, just over yeah, 90 and seconds. I, well, and I appreciate this, too, because on a personal level, um, my job is ending this week, and I could really, I, I need, you know, the book sales are helping feed my family well let's so. get to it let's get to it okay thank you mm -hmm. uh, all right we got about uh just over a minute and 15 okay i mean i hope that was okay to tell you I, oh yeah it just yeah, don't worry yeah that's all good how is the how is the COVID thing in Canada? Are uh, they trying to run around and vaccinate everybody? Uh, soon, soon. Uh, there's still a big debate on that in the House of Commons, which would be like your Congress or Senate. That's true. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Um, hey, Gil, if, if your audio is, and everything is out of sync, or you're noticing my my mouth is not lining up with my words, try hitting uh, refresh on your end and I'll try hit and refresh on this end a little bit. 
because uh, we had a couple of stutters here with lagging, so I think that's kind of what did it. I'm going to refresh here a little bit, see if that changes things up, and hopefully it'll change the signal. So you'll see that little thing happen there. All right, here we go, guys. It's pretty still. Halfway point of Space Down Radio tonight. I am Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I want to remind you that if you missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Space Down Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we are talking with author Lynn Monet. Her website, lynnmonet.com, where you can find her book, Omnipresent, the true story of what it's like for this single mom buying her first home, and the damn thing is haunted. Haunted as anything. Spirits don't like her there nor her kids. They're attacking them. Lynn, welcome back. Thank you so much. It's, it's, um, it, it definitely was was a hard time. Um, and i just like to say this. You know, a lot of people say to me, um, well, man, you know, the first time I had walked in that house and saw that guy hanging there, I would have been out of there. But people don't realize, you know, when you signed on the dotted line for a 30-year mortgage, you don't always have that option to just, just bolt and run and also i i really really loved the house i i felt that there had to be a solution but um as i was mentioning before um my friend ellen and i we were up in the kitchen she was holding the horse heads and the sound starts um to emit into the room um it's it's an unusual sound like i said the closest thing that i can think of is like a didgeridoo sound and and it's not something from this earth but if you've heard it once you will recognize it if you hear it again you'll know exactly what it is and um she heard it and she turned and she said to me what you know what is that sound she didn't turn she turned her head and i said remember i told you about the possibility of a ghost being the house i said listen i just want to show you a few things and then then we'll leave and she was holding the horse head and all of a sudden she started screaming she said she drops the horse head she's got one in each hand she drops them to the counter and she starts grabbing at her shirt, trying to pull it around. And um, she said, what is it? What is it? Is it a spider bite? She said, something's burning. Something's burning. And she kept pulling her shirt, trying to see if maybe if um, she had something crawling on her or whatever. So I, I went behind her, and I lifted up her, um, her shirt. And on between her shoulder blades, and even part of it was underneath her bra strap, was a claw mark. It was about a four-inch claw mark. And being in the medical field, when it, it, it looked like a cat scratch, it was one single scratch, and it was just welting and beating blood. And normally, being being a medical person, that is an initial response to a scratch. Never before does that welting process happen. Even if you bump the scab off, it just does not happen again so I asked her I said Ellen what happened did you you know rub up against the corner of the car window getting out did you bump into something what what caused what caused this um, um, on you and she said I don't know and she started screaming again and she says oh my god oh my god it's got me on my stomach and she went to lift up her shirt and she had a claw mark diagonal to the right of her of her belly button, um, just below her belly button, it was also doing the same thing. And so, um, at that time, this this fog had had started to um, to move forward into the room. It was like a portal that the demons 
were entering through. And so I told her, I said, they seem to be targeting her. So I told her, I said, leave. I said, just go out the door. I'm coming behind you. And at that point, I didn't even care whether the, the house was locked up or not because, you know, that house could take care of itself if anybody wanted to come in there. So we went ahead and we left, and she was complaining of that burning sensation from the claw marks all the way home. So um, um, this had happened. This was something that I couldn't deny, of course, and I, I, I went home to the single white trailer that I was living in and actually sat down for the first time on the computer looking through the Internet for um, – for a paranormal group, right. I, I'm, I'm thinking that there's got to be a solution for this. Right, a blessing on the house. Something's got to give that can can help get these these things out of my house because I had to move in there. You know, I, I like I said, I had already sold the place that I was that I was in. So the very next day, I got I I, I wasn't happy with the sites that I found because. So many of them were advertising um, that they that they could come in there, but they wanted to come in and get pictures and then put them on the internet. I didn't need someone to come in and tell me that I had an infestation with a demonic infestation. I already knew I had a problem. I wanted somebody to come in and get them out so that I could move into my house, and um, and that was part of part of the problem. Um, so I I. I, the very next day, I got out the yellow pages, and I went through every single church in those yellow pages, and I called every single one. And to my surprise, most of them referred me to the Catholics. And I was kind of surprised at that because I thought maybe somebody would want to take on this, this task to prove their seniority since there was so much competition between traditional religions. Um, a few of them told me, that if I had been attending their church, that I wouldn't be having this problem. Um, and and then there were two or three of them that when they heard that I was a single mother and I was desperate for help, they turned it around on me trying to claim that I was promiscuous, and that was the reason for which I was having my problems. And at that point, I was focused on my kids. I hadn't even been out on a date in four years. So that, of course, was not true either. But I, I understood that that even though these churches' slogans were, what would Jesus do? Well, he would have helped me. But I understood that because of their own fear and lack of wanting to admit that this could be happening and lack of, of, of knowledge of how to address it in an effective way. Yeah, where blame you. For the blame you. Yeah, yeah, just to turn it around on me. So I was surprised. I mean, I was Presbyterian at the time, and even the, ch the, the church that I was affiliated with um, shut the door on me. However, the Presbyterian minister um, did not, and he actually he actually told me. He said, "You know, um, talking about this to the church, the, the Bible thumpers are actually scaring me more than even the thought of things in your house." And he um, he then. Um, took me to a Catholic priest that was a friend of his, and unfortunately this man was was in the process of boxing up things to, to move to another to another um, Catholic church. And um, so, but he gave gave us some information on a Catholic priest that if, that if I continued to have problems that I could reach out to and have him come and do a blessing on the house. And also in that process, um, I had contacted... Um, a paranormal group from Georgia um, that was led by a, um, a, a priest called Andrew Calder, who has since passed away. May he rest in peace. And he came to the house and set up infrared cameras and actually got pictures of the ghost and confirmed the infestation that I had. And he said that it was a bad one. And he even warned me. He said, you know, even though I'm doing this blessing now, he said, you will always have to be diligent in in claiming your home and and casting out you know the demons if ever they show up again he said because of the type of infestation that i had that it was common that they would return because of something that they'd become used to there and of course in that moment that was the turning point for me because i told him i said there is no way 
I said, it's one thing being a single woman with children at home, having to deal with criminals at large, but there is no way that I am going to have to deal with that in my house. My house is supposed to be my haven. It's supposed to be where I can come home and relax. And what, what's going to happen if, if a window's open and an envelope blows off the table? You know, what, what's going to happen if, if, uh, if I decide to have extended family over for a Thanksgiving dinner and I now see this demon walking through the house and I stand up at the table screaming and pointing at it, you know, commanding it to leave in the name of Jesus Christ? What, you know, how many of my guests are going to stick around for dessert and not only that, come back or even invite me to their houses because I might be bringing more than chocolate cake? So I told him, I said, there is no way that I can do that to my children. Um, I said, you know, it, it, it's bad enough that they come, you know, oh, there's something in my closet, something under my bed. But in the case of my children, there might really be something under their bed or in their bed, right. which is worse. And then they come to me for protection and we're all huddled and scared because the sheets are getting pulled off the bed and i said there is no way that i'm going to put my kids through that and of course after i had seen after ellen got clawed i didn't take my children back to the house anymore i did or i did own it for a total of eight months and again i didn't sleep in it again after that either but, but I, I kept my children, uh, you know, away for, for safety purposes. And they only came back one time after that. And that was after um, the, the paranormal group had come through and, and blessed the house and said that it would be okay for them to come through. But then it turned out that it wasn't because the children started to get attacked again. And so, um, you know, that is when I really just threw in the towel and I said, I, I, I can't do this. Right. You know, to this day... Um, my son is 22 years old, and he was seven years old when that happened. And to this day, he will not sleep at night without a light on <clears throat> because it scared him so badly. He, he, there's almost like some post-traumatic stress from it because um, um, in, in addition to that, um, the cover of the book is a door with some creepy hands coming through it so you can make sure that you get the right one. And so much more happened than just what we're telling here. But he actually, that was an actual event that occurred in the house, the cover of that book. My son at seven years old was going in to use the master bathroom. And he is sitting on the toilet. And that is what he sees coming in at him while he is sitting in, in the toilet on that bathroom. And he agreed to help me design the book only in the sense that I would show it to him and say, is this what it looked like? Uh, yeah, but a little bit more of this there. And at that point, he told me, he said, I, I've helped you with this, but I don't want to be asked questions about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want you to bring me with you on a talk show. I will not do it. He said, I will not discuss this ever again. It was so upsetting to him that way that he, right. I mean, he was actually left with effects from it. I want to ask you, you started yes. bringing in paranormal teams. And, yes. you know, there, there's a big debate within the paranormal community. Should you charge money? Should you not charge money for the investigation? You are a, a, a worried parent. You are somebody who doesn't know what's going on. You don't understand the paranormal. You hit Google, what happens? Well, of course, they wanted to come in and take pictures, and, and it wasn't that they were always going to charge me money, but they were going to make profit off of my issue. So they did get paid one way or the other. I had people, I mean, when you're in that situation, you are desperate, and, and it's, it, it's not like you can call the Ghostbusters because they'll send the men in white coats. And um, so when someone comes forward and says, I can help you, You'll pay them anything that they want if you if you can come up with it just to have the things be gone and to have that peace of mind. The unfortunate part of that is, is a lot of those people come in and they make it worse. They end up riling up their ghosts and, 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 and saging, y'all, it's not enough. When you've got a demonic infestation, only, pardon the expression, but piss them off more than help. It will clear the negative energy of people arguing or maybe a, um, a lost soul that needs to move on. But when there's demonic activity, it does not make them leave. It makes them hide. 
So, um, you know, and then they, they, they reappear and they, they're angry when they reappear. So they end up stirring things up and then they walk off and leave you with, with ghosts that have been riled up. Um, it makes the situation worse. I mean, after I started having the blessings in the house, the whole situation exacerbated. I mean, it just, it just, you know, got, got worse. And I mean, um, I had, I had multiple, multiple witnesses that either were attacked or actually saw the entities in the house or heard them or dealt with issues with them besides even the people that I had coming in to, to, um, to bless the house. But this happened often. In the case of the paranormal group that I had come up, I was not charged anything. However, there was a charge in the cost of, of course, the traveling expenses, putting it up to a hotel for a couple of days. All of their meals had to be paid for. Of course, and this is reasonable. You can't expect somebody to come and spend hundreds of dollars to come and take care of your house. And I also... Um, had a second person that didn't charge me but would, would accept donations, and she was actually the, the most effective out of all of them, and she actually helped release the young man from the house in one of her rituals. She was an Indian Indian woman, as in feathers, not dot. And um, so, and I don't mean that disrespectful. I just wanted to make sure, you know, that, that they're, they understood that they're, she was native Indian. And um, But the thing was is that... Uh, um, I just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Just talking, you know, talking about her and having um, those people in there. Um, it, it is. It's so easy to be taken uh, taken advantage of. And um, however, coming away from the situation and actually clearing homes myself. Now that I have figured out how to do it, um, I understand how draining and exhausting it can be. I've literally slept three days. I've had to take off work and sleep three days after clearing some of these homes because of some of the, the, the negative energy that comes off of these sources. It is exhausting. Any psychic reader that, that is legitimate, anybody that has any type of gift that way will tell you how doing those readings and doing things like that really, really drain you of energy and you're exhausted afterwards. And people don't realize that, what a, what a physical toll those things actually take on a person, not to mention the fact that they may follow them home. So then on top of um, clearing your problem, then they have to go through expense of their own to clear their own problem. So, um, you know, I, the people that I actually had to pay were not effective, but of course the, the priest that came and, and blessed the house um, you know, they were they, it weakened the the um, the demons and and um, so they they weren't attacking as much at first. But then once they they got their energy back, they were back full force. You know, made, tri made tricking, doing uh, trick or trickery type of things. And I I had been exposed to them so much that I would I was able to see them when they right. would walk into a room. It was almost like I could either see them clearly out of my peripheral vision, or you could actually see the the waffling to the air. It was like a waffling to the air when spirits are, are in the room. And um, so um, the Indian woman that came in did not charge anything. She um, she was willing to take donations, and she was kind of specific about her price of donations. But at that point, I had no more money. I I, I was trying to get out of that house. Um, at that point, I, I, she was a one-more-shot kind of deal where this is my last effort. I'm hoping that this one will work because this lady, she actually took the time to speak to me on the phone first. And some of the things that she explained sounded so outside of the box and so bizarre that they actually made sense, if that even makes sense. Because I could relate to what she was saying right. with what I had experienced. So, okay. Um, let me let me ask you this: yeah. as we only got about four and a half minutes before we have to go to break, at the top of the okay. hour, Lynn Monet is our guest tonight. As you're bringing in these paranormal teams, is the activity getting stronger? Is it getting worse? It um, it could it well, 
let's put it this way, it depends on who the person was that was coming in to do it. In the case of the Episcopalian priest, it weakened things, but they didn't go away. In the case of the Indian woman, it definitely brought them down, and we were able to release the young man. He was able to cross over. In the case of the Catholic priest that came, that poor man was so, I mean, he was trembling. So they were drawing off of him, and it made it worse because because they were drawing off of his fear, and, um, and, and, they, and it did become worse after him. Okay, so, we, we, so, so when you allowed paranormal teams to come in, never mind the clergy, but the paranormal teams, because like I said earlier, you know, we've had people on the show where they get these paranormal teams come on out, and the next thing you know, you know, they go in there, they stir it up, you know, they get freaked out, and then they take off forever. Was that happening with you too? Um, a couple of people, yes. Yeah, a couple of people that came out that professed to be able to remove them. Um, they they were getting the willies through the whole thing, and because they were getting the willies, the, the, the demonic realm was um, feeding on that. Yeah, so then when they left, you know, I had, I had PO'd ghosts in my you know, house, but fortunately I had somewhere to go. You know, I didn't have to sleep there or stay there. I can't imagine what it would have been for some like for somebody that actually had to then live there with with the ghost after they had been riled up. So I was at least fortunate that way. Oh wow. Okay. So so in your experience with the paranormal teams, because we deal with a lot of them and a lot of them listen to this show. What what is mm -hmm. your opinion? What is in the next ninety seconds to two minutes? What is your advice for these paranormal teams when they're going into a residential area? Um, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't. To be honest, I don't even know where to start with that. Um, I, I, I actually know of an effective way to remove them now that I've stepped stepped away and had to experiment with a few things. But the thing is, is, is the saging thing is not enough. Um, if they're going to go in and do, do something, they have to do something much more than that. And, um, um, well, maybe, you know, I can get together with them sometime and we can talk about how to do that. So, um, because there are, there are some effective ways. But going in and riling them for these people and leaving, and the worst thing is, is when people contact and say, hey, look, they're still here. You know, you were here and they're still here and now it's worse. And... They don't want to come back, you know. They're like, oh, sorry, lady, or it must be something that you're doing wrong that made them come back. And that's a lot of what I got was, again, it was turned around on me. I so. bet. I bet. I mean, you know, here you are being taken advantage of by people in the paranormal. Yeah, I was. And, you know, it would have been different if I had had a husband, I think. But I wasn't. I was a mom alone with, with a 7-year-old and a 13-year-old. So... You know, it made it even worse. I didn't. I didn't have anybody to crawl underneath and hide behind. I. I was. I was the, the person in the front. So, you know, trying to protect my kids. No kidding. No kidding. How How did you? Uh, how did you get through this? We got about thirty seconds here. How did you get through this in order to um, to you know get some sanity back? Prayer, a lot of it. A prayer, a lot of it. I mean, it, it did. Tell, this this whole situation really, really made me question my faith. But I believe that it helped me to evolve more spiritually and rich in a richer way, where I have a completely different understanding than I did before. And that's what helped me get through. I bet. I bet. Lynn, you hold on and sit tight. We are going to go to break here. At the top of the hour as Lynn Monet is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. And we are going to have Lynn for another 30 minutes here on the Mighty SOR telling her story about the incredible hauntings that she's written in the book Omnipresent, which can be found on her website, lynnmonet.com, Amazon, and every online bookstore as well. Make sure you get this one. It's True Tales from a real haunting from our guest, Lynn Monet.
All right, we're clear. I'm just going to run my dog outside once again, and I'll be right back, okay? Okay, thank you. We invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hello, everyone. This is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightline Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines report on the Spaced Out Radio website, and let's figure out what's going on together. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Fall, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Hello, space Travelers, it's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best-rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. All right, Lynn, I am back. Okay. I'm going to fire off a bunch of questions to you in this next half hour. Because we we got okay. a lot to get through yet, and we're running out of time here. Uh, but when we get to the break at the bottom of the hour, just stick through the break, and then I'll say goodnight to you properly in the break. Okay. Okay, sounds good. All right. Yeah. This is awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> yeah you know it's funny because I kind of reflect on it and when people ask me about my book and I, I was reading a couple of chapters from it just the other day just you know and I'm thinking to myself oh my god that poor lady and you know the reality of it was that it was me kind of so to kind of like now looking through the window into the to the to that um I'm just so so glad that um I'm not having any issues with it now 
So. No, oh, that's good. <clears throat> that's good. We got just under 90 seconds. Okay. All right, just under uh, over 45 seconds. Thank you to both uh, Zoe Buttercup and Fapster for the super chats tonight. We really do appreciate the love and support. A great way you can support this show as well is by giving us a thumbs up, hitting that subscribe button, ringing that bell so you know when we are going to go live on Spaced Out Radio. And, uh, of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. And we have the SOR Vault. We got some new swag coming soon. I checked it out today. It is looking fine, people. Looking fine. We're going to post that the new uh, gear here very, very soon. And uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and on Instagram as well. Here we go in about five seconds. Hold on there, uh, Lynn. <clears throat> Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. I am Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. We welcome in everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on Talk Stream Live and Revolution Radio. All of our archives are free by listening to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. The only thing I ask for in return is bang on that subscribe button. The desert clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR space travelers club. Hocus pocus. Hocus pocus is your password. Use it wisely. Space travelers as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on spaced out radio. Our website is spaced out radio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on uh, Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, at Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce our guest, Lynn Monet. Her website, lynnmonet.com. She is the author of Omnipresent. This is a true story of her encounters of buying a haunted house and having to live with the demons that were torturing her her family, her friends, and even the construction workers that were in her house. Lynn, welcome back. Thank you. All right. I want to ask you right off the bat here. All right. You slept in the house for two nights. You owned it for eight months. Yes. You you uh, slept in it for two nights. Where were you staying while this was going on? I had the, uh, the, the, the single white trailer that I was originally living in. Um, I had been living in during waiting, waiting for the summer to come for my children. And, and I sold, I had sold that, that trailer around the month of May, which then made me, you know, want to, I would need to get moved into the house quicker. But, um, I ended up giving the people that bought the trailer from me back their money and never moved into the house. I mean, my furniture was moved in at one point, but I had to get everything moved back out. And um, so I, I did return their money, and I moved back into the, the trailer where I was. The, the thing was is I, th- there were no issues at that single-wide trailer, and there, there were only issues in that house. And so and, – and I haven't had any issues since then in that, in that way um, where I was living, where I've been living. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so the fact is you had a place to stay. You know, what did the bank say when only after eight months you're looking to sell this house? You know, your mortgage broker well, obviously is not going to be too impressed. No, I actually um, contacted the attorney who did the closing on the house, and I asked him if there was a loophole to get out of the mortgage, and he wanted, of course, to know why, and I just came right out and I told him, I said, the house is haunted. And he started to kind of chuckle and, you know, really, you know, and I said, yes. I said, if you don't believe me, 
They said, all of my furniture has moved in here. The electric's on. The water's on. You and your family are more than welcome to come and spend the night or spend the whole weekend, for that matter, um, here and have the whole house to yourself, if you don't believe me. And he declined. And um, the thing that was ironic about that is he actually, um, when I closed on the house, the house that I bought after that, um, he actually was also the closing attorney. And he told me, he said, you know, I remembered what you told me. He said, and there was a house recently that I closed. He said that I felt like something was standing behind me the whole time. So it actually kind of opened up his world and his um uh, not perception, that's not the word I'm looking for, but his, um, it kind of opened him up to the reality of the possibility of something like that, because it's just not something that people talk about. So unless they're like us, you know, we, we all have experienced things, we are interested in learning about these things, but for the most part, people want to keep their heads in the sand and, um, you know, and, and, and deny that it exists because of their fear. Yeah, and, and I understand that. I mean, you know, you can only push yourself so far, right? And you were at your wits' end with this. I mean, what were your family and your friends saying about this? Not the friends who were attacked, but the fact that you're coming out and saying, look, I got to get out of this house. I can't put my kids here. I mean, were people laughing at you? Were they just rolling their eyes? I know in my own personal sense, when I've brought up things to family and friends, you know, you kind of see them, you know, just kind of tune out and walk into a different room. Well, you know, I, I'm very straightforward. And the people, I, I was actually surprised because they didn't do that. As a matter of fact, I had many, many people flock to me to tell me their stories. And they said to me, you know, I've never told this to anyone before in my life, but I know that you'll believe me. And they would start to tell me different things that had happened. And you know what? I really didn't care if they were laughing. But people actually, um, they, you know, of course, there were some people that approached and, and, well, you know, if you let our church get in there, we could get those things out. And then, of course, I invited them over. They wouldn't show up. They were kind of mocking and laughing. But I didn't care. But, but I was shocked at the amount of people that actually came forward with their own stories and wanting to share or even asking for help. Um, and, that, and that continues on today. I have not really been ridiculed um, by, by anybody about it. Um, not, I mean, maybe heckled a little bit like in, in um, you know, people leaving their, their opinion of, of what I'm talking about. But for the most part, no. People have, have they, they've started to open. They've started to evolve and have a better understanding. How did the spirits and the and the ghosts react to you all of a sudden moving all of your stuff out of the house? Well, there was one, for instance, um, that the there there were as I had made mention there were two demons and a young man in the house. The the spirit of the young man in the house, and of course he was released during one of the blessings. He that poor man. Um, they had me open up the sliding glass door, and he ran so fast to the light um, past me. But, uh, you know, I had to coerce him during the daytime when I was there by talking out loud and telling him that they were coming and it was his time to go, that he needed to take that chance because I was leaving and um, he wasn't going to have that chance again. But there was one, for instance, I had moved most, most of my stuff out, and then just just to kind of touch base on this, before I moved my things out, I was concerned about carrying the boogers home with me to where I was living. And so I went online and I looked up everything that I could on blessing things. So everything was covered in salt and holy water and, and blessed more than once, my children's toys and things before I started bringing them back. But um, in addition to that, there was one point where I was down in the garage and there was this storage space underneath the stairs. And I went and I opened the door to get, uh, my Christmas decorations were in there, and I went to get them out, and that wolf thing was in there, and it was growling at me while I was removing my things. And I said to it, I just remained calm, and I said to it, these are my things, and I'm going to take them out of here. I, I don't plan to confront you. I don't plan to 
to, you know, get into any kind of chaos here with you. I'm just here to get my things and I'm taking them. So I got them out and I, and I, and I took them and I placed them towards the back of the garage. Then when I turned around, that wolf thing that I originally had seen on the stairs and now was in the, underneath the stairs, it was also the thing that kept playing with the locks. Um, he was standing in front of me, in front of the garage, double garage doors facing me. And I just simply looked at him and I said, I'm leaving. You know, I'm, 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 I'm leaving. I, I, I'm leaving you with your house. I get, you know, I, I surrender. I'm leaving. I don't want any issues with you. I'm not going to confront you. And I'm, I just want my stuff and I'm out of here. And as I turned around to walk away, I could feel his claw go into the crease of my arm where my elbow bends. And something just told me very strongly came through to me. Don't turn around. Don't look at it. Keep walking forward and out of the garage. So I went into the door that led into the hallway and up to the stairs and walked off on the thing. I feel that at that point that if I had become frightened or enraged or screaming at it, that it would have empowered it and it could have done something to physically harm me. Um, I also felt that it might want to try to possess me, and that wasn't going to happen. And I made that clear, too. I'm like, I am not interested in any part of you. You can have this house. You win. I'm leaving. And that's exactly what my attitude was. And I didn't play their game anymore. A lot of times people think that by challenging them and commanding them to leave, that that works. And it actually seems become more of a game with them then they kind of hide and then come back out when you're not looking so but but keeping yourself neutral keeping your emotions intact when dealing with them doesn't play their game and it's not fun for them to bother you if, if they can't if they can't get a rise out of you that they can actually get something from it so I feel like somebody told me once I said I'm not afraid of them I've seen them so much they don't scare me and they leave me alone because I'm no fun, you know, for, for, for them to bother me. I, I had at one point I was downstairs in that house getting stuff moved out, and I could feel the second demon, which had its own own look and own, own thing, and I, could, and I knew that he was there. And I, I expected for him to do something to try to get that shock value. And all of a sudden, I felt something in my pocket that felt like a coiling snake that then slithered down the side of my leg. But I knew there was no snake. So I did not react to it. And I turned and I faced the door and I said, very funny. You wanted to try to scare me with a snake in my pocket. And I could see the thing with my own eyes looking at me like, what? You know, he was shocked that I called his bluff. And that I did not freak out over what he was doing, which most people, you'd be like, oh, yuck, what is that? You know, you'd start grabbing your pant leg and looking. But I knew, I knew he was there, and I knew that he was going to do something. So I was ready for it. And I didn't, I didn't give him the reaction that he wanted. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So th that strength, you turning your back on him and basically saying, you know what, this is over, this is done. All of a sudden, it was like you, ha you were guarded, that you couldn't, he couldn't get you. I was guarded because I wasn't playing the game anymore. I wasn't interested in playing with them anymore. They couldn't scare me. They couldn't, you know, there was, there was nothing else that there was for them. I mean, there, there was no fun. I was no fun for them anymore. Right. Okay. So you, you pack up your stuff, you get yourself out of there and your children are safe. You are safe. Did any mm -hmm. of these spirits or demons come to your next place of residence no nope they did not oh that had and to I'll be so refreshing I, yes it was and i'll tell you what, what, how how i i and I, I also believe that they're still the two demons are still in that house after i sold the house <clears throat> to the people and this is not in my book everybody so this is a juicy tidbit um <clears throat> i uh, was in the area and I just had a curiosity. It was about six months after I had sold the house. I was in the area, and I thought, well, you know, I'm just kind of curious. I wonder if they're doing okay. So I decided to drive past their street. I was not going to turn down the street because it was a dead end. 
And I didn't want to get that close to the house, but I did want to drive down and just see that they had made any changes in the yard or anything like that and that they were still settled in there. And as I passed by the street, I noticed that there was a sign in the, in the front yard, but where it was situated, it could have been in their yard or the neighbor's yard. And um, so I, I passed by the street, and I'm like, I really had to find out what, what that sign was. I was hoping beyond hope that it was not a for sale sign because I really wanted for these people to have a good life in that house and enjoy, you know, enjoy their home, um, you know, in some way. So, but curiosity got the cat and I, I turned my car around and I drove up to the street and I said a prayer and I said, please don't let them come out of their house because they'll recognize me driving down the street. Number one, you know, number one, Number two, protect me if there is anything um, that's so menacing in that house. So I drove past the house, and sure enough, it was a for sale by owner sign, and it was in their yard. And my heart just just sunk in my chest because I realized that the the powers that be in that house were, were still, you know, overruling overruling people and, and making them them leave the residence. And um, so I had to go to the end of the street. It was a dead end, so I had to turn around, and now I had to pass by the house a second time. As I was driving up in front of the house, I had my radio playing, some Marvin Gaye, it was real low, um, but as I got into the very front of the house, my radio started blaring in my car, just full of blast blaring. I'm trying to turn it off, I'm trying to turn it down and nothing is working so I sped up to the stop sign because the house was the second one and on the left I sped up to the stop sign and I immediately turned off the street and within seconds of me turning off the street my radio shut off so to me that was a calling card they wanted they wanted not then not only did they know that I was there they wanted me to know that they were still there and um, I, I never went back they had your number. They could sense you being there. Yes. Oh, that just sh- mm-hmm. sent shivers down my spine. Oh, my goodness. Right. You know, a thing that I learned with this whole thing um, from the priest is that there, as there's a hierarchy of angels, there's also a hierarchy in a sub-level of demons. And the lower the, demonic, the demons get, the more things that they can do. They can leave bruise marks. They can pull hair. They can leave bite marks. They can call people. Um, there were three situations with this priest that I that was with the Georgia Paranormal Group at that time that was actually working with women that had been raped by by demons, and so they they can they can do these things, which also then made sense of the bite marks on my son's leg because I didn't know that at the time, but but I did, but I did learn that um, after the fact, and, um, and and people, you know, they they don't realize how how aggressive that the things can get and how important it is the most important thing to do is to remain calm you got to remain calm lynn we have you for about five and a half minutes here on spaced out radio and this has been an incredible incredible journey that you have been on personally regarding this and you know i always am am remiss to ask this question as well all right. A lot of people who have this type of activity also have extraterrestrial presences around as well. Did that happen with you? Not in that house, but since coming away from that issue and, and, and the issue and, and the gift that I was left with, which I do call it a gift as a nurse, it's come in very handy with people that are crossing over. I have now the ability to see interdimensionally. I can see dimensions and frequencies that most people cannot see. And with that being said, um, I have seen aliens. In a very interesting case, I had a patient on a on a uh, on a unit, and it was it was a um, um, upscale um, assisted living type setting and um, I had this this one person she was with me for two years and I worked at this job for 10 years and every weekend I would be going down the hallway to give her her sleeping pill and her pain meds and on three different occasions um, I walked into her room and I could see on the other side of her bed these beings standing there um, and it looked as if they were 
pulling things out and plugging things in, kind of like an old-time switchboard operator. And all three of the things were the exact same height. They came up to my shoulder. Um, when I entered into the room to give the lady this one time her, pain, her, her medication, I always had to check her blood pressure and things like that before giving her pills because she also was getting cardiac meds. So, but my, my um, battery-operated blood pressure cuff would, would die. I mean, I would put it on her wrist and push the button, and it would die before I could even get the reading. And this, this happened um, whenever those things were in the room, and I then would end up having to take it manually. So I didn't say anything to the lady because I didn't want to alarm her who wants to take uh, pain medicine or, or from a lady that's seeing things in your room. But I watched, I watched them, and at one point, one even came around the bed and walked through me. And I said, excuse me. I mean, it was so, uh, I it just automatically, I'm like, oh, excuse me. You know, and this thing was coming over to the side of the bed that I was on. Out of the three times, and only in her room, and only with her, and when she passed away and was gone, somebody else was put in that room, and I never saw them again. But on the three different occasions, they were the exact same being. Sometimes there were as many as like eight in the room, never, never fewer than five that were in the room. And all of them were the similar height they had on the same whitish, gray-looking, one-piece uniform thing. They actually had covering over their faces. It was as if they could see through the fabric, so I couldn't see eyes or anything like that. But one of those three times, a one of the, the I want to call them aliens, that came with the group was taller than the rest, literally like by two feet taller. And he was the only one that one time that was different, but the uniform was the same. But all of them continued to do this work on this lady. She was laying on her side facing me where they were, were pulling in and replugging these these like circuits or something. And that is why it brought me to to question to someone who who um, is is also somewhat of, of an expert on this kind of thing. Is it possible for alien beings to be intermingling in a humanoid form amongst us? And um, you know, and and so that has come into play with with my ability to see interdimensionally um that i did on those three occasions see alien form oh, that's, in that woman's room that's scary that is scary right there lynn i want to to say thank you so much for coming on spaced out radio tonight it has been an absolute pleasure to to get to know you to hear your amazing story and to learn thankfully you're not being haunted by these demons any longer and and that is uh, very very comforting to hear do us a favor we got about one minute here tell everybody where they can find your book your website and you got a new book coming out hopefully next year yes um, my website is currently under construction but you can still go to the website it'll give you my my um, email address you can contact me there too for a book if you're having trouble with Amazon most of it does go through Amazon though um, there is it is in, in, a, in a covered book as well as an ebook. Um, in addition to that, um, I will be coming out with a book called "The Colors of Heaven: Beginnings Never End." My 11-year-old added that in, um, and um, it is a story about the actual um, process of dying, death, and afterlife, and what happens on both sides of the veil as the body prepares to transition into. Um, leaving the body, the soul leaving the body, and the preparation by the loved ones on the other side getting ready to receive. And um, I just would like to say, too, with that being said, that I've seen this. I, I, was, I, I did geriatrics for the last 17 years of my 35 years as a nurse, and I've seen lots of people pass away. And there are similar things that occur with these people over and over again, right. regardless of what their religion is. Right. So, um, you know, it, it, it's not it's not about that. Right. Um, Lynn, I got I got to let I got to let you go right there. But thank you so much. Coming up next, we're gonna hook up with Vancouver and the shift, and we're gonna get to the newswire and the thought of the day. Stay tuned. More spaced out radio coming up.
sorry I ran out of time. That is okay. That is okay. Like I said, you can bring me back if you want. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I loved it. Thank you so much. You were amazing. And your story is amazing. And I'm very glad that you guys are safe. Very glad. Yes, we are. I just wanted to to share with you um, the one worker that 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 was um, at the house the day that I was there with the young man was a cousin of a friend of mine that I worked with. <clears throat> so when he disappeared from the house and never came back, I, I actually asked her, I said, you know, ask Bobby why, why he never came back. And so he came to her house on, on around 4th of July and had a beer. So he was feeling talkative and she asked him what happened at the house. And he told her, he said, we're not on the radio, right? Yeah, we are. Uh, well, we're on, we're on YouTube. So, uh, I do have to run. Okay. You know what? Let's talk soon okay. because I do have to hook up okay. with the radio station in Vancouver here. Uh, I love oh, I love you. Thank you so much. We and I'll make sure that uh, Corey stays in touch with you. Okay. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. How do I get right. to that chat room? Uh, just go to YouTube dot com forward slash spaced out radio. And then you'll see that we are live. You just click on there. As long as you're logged into YouTube, um, mm-hmm. you could join the chat. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. You too. Bye bye. What an honest, genuine lady. Honestly, just a a great lady. Very honest. Very upfront. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. We're just waiting to hook up with Vancouver here so we can jump on and uh, and talk to um, uh, Vancouver. We got Eric tonight. Normally we have Shane who's hosting, but we got Eric tonight. So that's where we're at. That scared me. That scared me. Oh, you made me jump again. Oh, you scared me. Mr. Mr. Dave Scott, how are you doing tonight? Good, man. Say hello to the YouTube crowd. Hey, YouTube crowd. Um, yeah, just uh, catching base with Dave Scott for our uh, link up with the shift in a, in a little bit here. Yeah. It's going to be good. Great. It's going to be good. Uh, yeah, I just let you know that um, Eric Chapman is the host tonight. Yes. So Shane's... Uh, he, he messed up his back. So I heard. Eric's I heard. Tonight. But, um, yeah, um, all, all good for that. Um, yeah, and we're – yeah, we'll, we'll try and aim for 36 as usual on yep. your end. Um, but we're a little less than 90 seconds away here on our end. But sure. uh, everything should, should line up as usual. Yeah, sounds good, man. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm about uh, 100 seconds away from hooking up with you here well just okay, uh, just over good, just dude. over that so uh yeah not a problem I'll, I'll wait up and wait on and uh i'll let you know when i'm done sounds good dave thank you so much all right man we're hooked up with vancouver look at that All good.
rounded third. We're headed for home tonight on Space Down Radio. I'm Dave Scott sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for joining us. Want to remind you that if you missed portions of this show or, or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Now, every Tuesday we hook up with the shift in Vancouver. This time, Eric is in the hot seat. And we're going to mm-hmm. say hello to Eric. How you doing, Eric? I'm doing good, Dave. How you doing, my man? I am getting ready for Halloween, man. And once again, I, I am going costumeless. Is this your favorite time of year, Halloween, because of the stories and the tales and all the cool stuff that's happening? No, man. My favorite time of the year is Christmas. I'm oh. a Christmas guy. I'm I, Now that just really. I know. I'm like Clark Griswold, man. You do it all. You got the whole. You all well. Usually, I guess not this year. But you're having the whole family over. You're cooking the big meal. You're having the big tree. All that stuff. You love it. Uh, you know what? I I love the feeling of going into a, 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 a tree farm or into the forest and actually cutting down my own Christmas tree. It it just there's something about that that is just beautiful and natural, and that's something that I enjoy. Old Davy enjoys that. Plus, it gives me a reason to fire up my old chainsaw too. Yeah, I was going to say, that's always a fun part. And if you go out into the bush, maybe you'll see something cool out there too, right? Oh, you always hope. You always hope. Yeah. Never seems yeah. to happen. So, uh, um, okay, um, I, I have something. I have a little tale I want to tell you, and I, I'm, I'm wondering about it because it happened to me a while ago. Sure. And then I have some questions about some demons and things like that. So I want to start with my story, Scott, or Dave, and see if um, you've ever heard of something like this happen. So um, All right. I was lying on my bed. I lived in a small town called Barhead, Alberta. Yes. And uh, shout out to the Steelers. But I was lying on my mattress, and it was just on the ground. It wasn't on a bed frame. And um, I was having a nap. And while I was sleeping, I, ha- I was having a dream. It was a calm dream. It wasn't an excited dream. There wasn't anything intense happening. But I had the sensation that I was floating. Oh. And so in my dream, I'm just kind of floating around. Not high, not ceiling high, like maybe four or five feet in the air. And it's just a sensation. And it's, 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 it was a normal feeling to have in the dream. Right. So I'm dreaming away, and then all of a sudden, I wake up. And in that split second between being awake, transitioning from my dream into the wake, being awake, I was floating in my dream. Then when I woke up and opened my eyes, I felt like I was floating for a split second. And all of a sudden, without even thinking of it, I just heard this. And my heels hit the ground like I was actually floating. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't know, I, I, I've had this, it's been bothering me, and I remembered about it the other day, and I knew I was talking to you. So I, have you heard of things like this? It was just oh, like yes. a ghost trying to pick me up? or what, what, Is there any you explanation had, to it? You had what they call an out-of-body experience. Really? Yeah, so in your dream, you actually, it sounds like you, you left your body, and then as your, your body started waking up, you actually got back into your body before your body actually became conscious Ooh. again. So a lot of people have experienced this, and, and many spiritualists will say that when you are having that, or every single night, all of us, when we're dreaming, go through this astral projection where we get to go into different places or travel to different areas, you know, and that's how we do it. Yeah. So very normal. Very normal. You don't have aliens. You don't have ghosts. Okay. Okay. All right. You're safe. Okay. Just, okay. En- just awesome. enjoy it when it happens. Yeah. You know what? I, I actually, I wanted, it happened so long ago. I'm looking forward to it happening again. And to be honest, I would be happy if it was a ghost. I'm, I'm more than happy than having a I know you are. You're excited about this yeah. stuff, Eric. I get you. I get you. Really? Okay, good. Okay. And, um, and in your email, um, you mentioned demons, aliens, and ghosts for the sure. chat tonight. Now, I... I have a question about demons. Yes. Because in, in, in my upbringing, and all I know about them is that they come from hell. So it's, it's almost like a biblical thing. Is that, is that the case, or am I way off? What is a demon? Well, that is something that comes from the pits of hell, as you stated. You know, old Beelzebub himself has himself an army there that every now and again they like to try and, you know, put it in a Canadian hockey terms. They like to drop the gloves with us, torture us, do all this kind of stuff. I actually just had a lady on the air 
named Lynn Monet. She actually has a brand new book out about this house that she bought. She was a single mother and, you know, finally has the money to afford to buy a house. And the house that she wants is like her dream house. Well, the problem was they got some demons around there. Demons. In the eight months that she saw, uh, owned the house, they they were able to stay in the in the residence two nights because they were attacked. Scratch marks across the stomachs and backs, and her one child was, uh, you know, complaining that his arm hurt, and he looks down and there's bite marks on the on his arm. I mean, it's just it was ravenous and disgusting, you know, and it was so bad that not even. The clergy that she called in would come in to help her. I mean, that's how no that's how harsh this this case was. So the good news is she sold the house, and the demons didn't follow her. They stayed in the residence. Uh, she saw the one. It looked like a wolf, and it would it would continually like show its claws and teeth at her. And she finally had enough and and was able to to uh, just gain the strength to walk away from it. And it scratched her one final time, and she just kept going, just kept going. Wow. Yes. Um, will they follow if, if, like you mentioned there, she sold the house. To move. Will they? Will a demon follow you from At, house to house? If it's attached to you, yes, it will. Okay. If you've allowed it to attach it. So next question is, how do you allow it yep. to attach? Okay. You keep yep. trying to communicate yep. with it. You keep giving it attention. You keep giving it fear. You keep being scared. You keep acknowledging it. That gives it strength. Yes. So it's not like, because I've heard that you want to, if there's a ghost in the room, you want to be like, acknowledge them and say, hey, maybe you could, you know, not be here anymore and go somewhere else. And that sometimes gets rid of them. But if you do that with a demon, that's not a good idea. No, no, you you don't. And that's the problem with the paranormal. You don't know what you're dealing with. Right. That that's why, like the last couple of weeks, I told John and Shane, you know, when it comes down to it at this time of year, everybody wants to have that ghostly encounter or experience. You don't know what you're getting. You really don't, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, that's part of the, for me. That's part of the draw to it all, too, though. You know, so it's kind of dangerous because, like, I want to be like exposed to this weird thing that I have no no clue about. But again, it could be dangerous, and I could be getting claw marks on my stomach when I wake up in the morning. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. But about but now, um, th- you you mentioned you're a Christmas guy, but Hall- Halloween does does. Is it is it a spiritual thing around Halloween? Like all Hallows Eve is is there a connection? Is there a real connection to the spiritual world and Hall- and Halloween? Well, according to the spiritualists, okay, the, the this veil thing. I don't know what the heck this veil yeah. is, but apparently yeah. it is thinner at this time. So that's where all of these netherworld type creatures have an easier time of accessing our area and our timeline and. And that's where everybody tends to think that, you know, Halloween brings out the, you know, I think it has something to do with the solstice or something. I don't really understand yeah. it, right? Yeah. But but yeah. it just seems to, to bring out all of these spiritual activity. And, and, you know, when you add that to if this veil really does thin, then you add to the fact that we as people – you know, we start talking spooky ghost stories. Look, radio stations such as yours, okay, they don't cover a lot of paranormal stuff until hmm. the, we get closer to Halloween. Then all of a sudden, right. they start reporting on maybe the 10 most haunted restaurants in the city or, you know, the 10 most haunted locations in the province. Yeah, yeah. And and that's when it comes out. So people start putting energy towards it. Energy with a veil thinning makes things happen. You know, it's, it's like energy. It's, it's really all about the energy with all this stuff, isn't well, it? Well, it's like it's like a, a car can't start unless you got remote start, but a car can't move unless you put the key in the ignition and turn it on. It's the same thing. So every October we turn this thing on, and that's what happens. So so we can. Well, I don't know if we don't want to turn it on because sometimes it's really cool. So just in order, again, just not feeding that energy and keeping it to yourself and not being so curious. And maybe you won't run into the, so many of these experiences if you are running into them. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. the point. Wow. You know, if you don't want that, demons, you don't want ghosts, you don't want aliens, don't ask for them. Real simple. <laughs> right. you, you make a lot of sense. It really is. Yeah. And the thinning of the, 
And the thinning of the veil, though, has anybody ever tried to, like, punch through it fully? I don't even know what the heck the veil is. I'm just going off, you know, like, 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 the veil, yeah. like, is there a bride on the other, is Bridezilla on the other end of that veil? I don't know, right? right? Yeah. I don't know. Is, is it like one is it like one of those veils that's over your bed, and the other side like a tropical beach with Could be. some, some beautiful drinks? Keep the and mosquitoes like, out, right? Yeah. Keep the mosquitoes <laughs> and the demons out. Could be. Uh, do, you have, do you have any good uh, ghost stories that you've heard lately? Okay. You know what? I, I actually, what I had planned for you tonight is you work in a radio studio. I work in a radio studio. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah you got All it. All right. Yeah. So I figured I would share with you and your audience a couple of weird things that have happened over the years while I've been hosting this show. Oh, yeah, I love that. All right, because you know radio studios, you know, we're all tech, we are all got our gear up. My gear has never really been messed with. I'm lucky that way, knock on wood. But I'll share yeah. a couple of stories here with you. Number one. Yes, please. We'll share the, the story of Carl. Okay, Carl, okay. I had to give him a name because I didn't know what else to call him. So I'm, okay, just really quickly, I, I worked with a I worked with a show host once for eight months, and she she called me Carl for eight months because she didn't know my name, and I just let her call me Carl. But anyways, go ahead, Carl. That's all right. Uh, Brian Burke, when I worked in Vancouver, Brian yeah. Burke always used to call me Tim or Jeff, and yet, and the only time he called me Dave was literally. <laughs> On on the day he got fired from the Canucks, he held a press con- they held a press conference and he shook my yeah, yeah. he shook my hand and he says, "Dave, it's really been a pleasure working with you." <laughs> oh, I love that. Dave. I'm like, That's really I'm like funny. four years, four years. <laughs> really? of a, yeah. No, it's true. It's true. That's Anyways, really funny. okay, let's let's get back to the okay, the other Carl. Now. Yeah, April twentieth, twenty fifteen. I'm I'm doing my show. And I, in my old house, I had my studio, a real terrible studio, not like I have now, okay? But it was right beside my front door, and it, I converted my daughter's old bedroom into this. So right beside where I was broadcasting, I had a window to my left, about two and a half feet, and the front door. And it's like 17 minutes into the show, I'm interviewing this guy named Harvey Kraft, and we're talking about Buddha, of all things. And I see something move out of the corner of my eye. And you know as well as I do that noise in the background when you're doing a radio show sucks. Yep. Okay, it's terrible. So I'm thinking, oh gosh, someone is here. I'm I'm going to have the, they're going to knock at the front door and or they're going to ring the doorbell. That's going to come across. Then my two dogs are going to start barking. And barking dogs never sounds good on the radio. Sounds pretty yep. amateur. Well, yep. after a couple of minutes, I realized my dogs aren't barking. Nobody's knocked at my door. Nobody's come inside. So I do what anybody would do. I turn my chair to see, maybe like, is somebody trying to sneak up and break into my vehicles or what? Because I yeah. lived in Mission, yeah. British Columbia at that time. Okay. And I turn my chair, look out the window. And all of a sudden, my eyes focus because I could see something there. And on the other side of the window is a large-headed alien gray staring right back at me. Now, is that like the – I'm, I'm, I'm picturing like the typical, like stereotypical alien. Yes. That you, when you say that, is yes. that like with the big kind of – The big black – wow. the first thing I saw was the silverish yeah. white head, this giant bulbous yeah. head – with these giant yeah. black eyes staring back at me. What did it what did it do when it no, did it notice you notice it? Oh yeah. And so I did what any man would do. I screamed like a banshee and yeah. jumped back in my chair. And Please, then yeah. I'm, and I'm calling I, my mom. Yeah. I was startled. And so yeah. so then I I jump up and I and I like I'm only a step and a half from the window at this point. I jump yeah. up and I would have seen any human being running away i would have seen right okay yes yes because the window's right there i could see all the directions whatever this thing was was gone like vanished and so after a few months and this story rattled me for a few months i had to give him a name so i that's how the legend of carl came around carl came okay (laughs) yeah so there's that one and i I know we're running out of time Uh, i got we got about a minute okay another one for you i yeah yeah 
I was doing this story, uh, this show with a gentleman named Anthony Kenyatta who had this haunted doll called Harold. And he believed that the spawn of Satan was in Harold's body or in the doll's body. In the doll. Okay. So before the show, I'm talking to Anthony. He's like, dude, I don't know. Something may happen tonight. Usually when I do these interviews, something weird, the phone starts clicking or hangs up numerous times. I'm like, okay, whatever. All right, 45 minutes into yeah. into the show, I see something out of the corner of my eye again. All right, I turn and I look, and there is a cloaked black figure standing about 18 inches from my left shoulder. Very thin. Oh, wow. And I'm yeah. watching this thing, and I watch it disappear right in front of me. And Shot, like dissolved away into nothing? Dissolved into nothing. So I said to Anthony, I said, I think... Harold just showed up at my house. He goes, what did oh, you... Oh, dang. He goes, what did you see? So I told him what I just told you, and he goes, oh, yeah. my, he goes, oh my God, my best friend just had that happen three nights ago. No way. Yes. So... Oh, I love... That's what I... I love that. That was, that was my favorite story. I like that one a lot. Yes, my friend. So there's a <laughs> lot of weird and a lot of woo that happens when you do a show like this. You just got to enjoy it when it happens. And I enjoy it every time we talk, my friend. Thanks for joining us again. Absolutely, my friend. You take care, and thank you to all your listeners, and have a safe Halloween. Awesome. You too, and all your listeners too. Awesome. Haunted Dolls. Dave Scott. Absolutely. And here we go with the SOR Newswire. Let's get to it, shall we? The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the UFOs? Yeah, what the heck? Experts say bright lights spotted in the sky over Hawaii were likely the remnants of a booster from a rocket that launched 12 years ago. John O'Meara, chief scientist of the WM Keck Observatory in Waimea, said the lights spotted in the sky this past weekend were likely from the booster of a Chinese rocket that was launched in 2008. Mary Beth Lakechak, Strategic Communications Director for the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope, said the appearance of the lights lines up with the projections of the booster's re-entry path. We can 100, can't be 100% certain because we don't have any of the pieces of the debris, Lechek stated, but the pattern of the lights that we saw in, in our time lapse combined with this map, this flight path, and the precision at which all of these companies are able to estimate where their objects will enter and how they will break up is what really leads us to believe that this was the Venusat 1 re-entering the atmosphere. You know, the funny part about it is I watched this thing. I've watched three different angles of this, and the video that they are showing literally shows something breaking up, and the lights all have these trails, like comet trails, all right, or asteroid trails when they come on in. The three videos that I watched didn't have that. They had blinking lights. They had they had stationary lights. They had lights up above where you could almost, because the lights were so bright, it looked like something else. I think this one's a cover-up. Call, you know, put the tinfoil on, okay? Put the tinfoil on, but this, to me, did not look like anything breaking up. And I've seen that, okay? We've seen videos of rockets breaking up, of of debris coming down and, and, you know, causing sparks as it burns into the atmosphere, meteorites, everything like that. Looked nothing like that. This thing was floating in the sky. Floating. I'm disagreeing with the scientists on this one. I think Hawaii got some aliens. I really do. All right. A new massive reef measuring about 1,600 feet has been discovered in Australia's Great Barrier Reef, making it taller than some of the world's highest skyscrapers. Scientists found the detached reef which is the first to be discovered in more than 120 years in waters off of North Queensland while on an expedition above research vessel Falkor. 
The reef was discovered back on October 20th, and scientists completed an underwater mapping of the seafloor of the northern Great Barrier Reef. At 500 meters high, it is taller than the Empire State Building. How cool is that? What a discovery. Let's get to the thought of the day, shall we? Let's do this. Thought of the day happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's thought of the day is as follows... Tell me a story about your experience living in a haunted house. Kira, my house itself is not haunted, but I have many antiques that hold spirit energy. Davy, a false wall was discovered in an outbuilding on a local farm. The false wall concealed a sealed room that contained only one thing, a strange spiral-shaped bone. As soon as the bone was removed, poltergeist activity began, and a series of bad luck befell the household. Until the bone was returned and the false room, resealed. Gail, it was an old house we had temporarily rented. It had an attic that was kept locked by the owners. From the very first at night, we could hear footsteps walking around the attic. That was creepy enough, but whatever was in there took an extreme dislike towards me. How do you not like Gail? Come on. Ryan, well, as soon as I started remodeling, it started remodeling me. And that was it. Now it's a bed and breakfast with portals to hell. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Space Down Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, in your cars, at work, wherever you may be. Thank you to everybody in our chat rooms on Spreaker, YouTube, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club at our website, and on Twitter with all the Snarkers and Snarkats at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Good to have you back, Goddess Michelle. You are a hero being a nurse during this COVID crisis. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, say it with me. We own the night, Mr. Fumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But tomorrow, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we got room for them, too. Good night.